Hello everyone, to my Phyrexia All Will Be One limited set review. This is gonna take a while, so if you want kind of the shortcut, feel free to subscribe to my Twitch channel or become a Patreon supporter, even better, and there you'll get access to all my tier lists for my set reviews. So that's a handy spreadsheet with a nice overview of all my card ratings, which I'll also try and keep up to date, since I'm sure some of these ratings will fluctuate over time as I play the set more. So that's the easiest way to get a quick overview of the entire set. And then for now, we'll be taking a look at my rating system. And to give you an idea of some of the cards from the previous set, we start with the highest grade, which is the S tier, which is reserved for the ridiculous bombs in the set. So in the Brothers War, Titania's Command is one of the few cards that I've ended up giving an S grade. This is a card that can easily take over a game, even if you're very far behind and makes it very hard for the opponent to recover. Then we've got the A tier, these are still bomb level cards that you're very happy to first pick and these can also easily win a game but maybe are a little bit easier to interact with for the opponent than some of the S tier level bombs. So Yawgmoth and Steel Seraph being great examples of A tier level cards. These will easily still dominate a game if they go unanswered but there are definitely more answers out there. Then the B grade are definitely still cards you're very happy to first pick in a pack. These include some nice 2 for 1 creatures, some efficient spot removal. Typically the best common removal spells in each color will end up in the B tier. Taking a look at Prison Sentence in white for instance, just a nice efficient removal effect that you'll happily play in every deck that's playing this color. And then we go down to the C plus category. Now the C plus are still definitely above average playables. You've got Disfigure, so some removal spells that don't quite get to the B tier may fall in the C plus category, since they're maybe a little bit more conditional in nature or they don't take care of the biggest bombs in the set. So Disfigure I would classify as a C plus as well. Then the C tier are still going to be cards you end up playing in most decks since you need some filler to round out your deck. You can't have all the C plus and B level cards unfortunately. So some of the other creatures end up in the C tier. Still cards you'll play a decent amount of the time. Then we've got the D tier. These are cards you should definitely avoid if possible. These are maybe very conditional cards that only work in very rare circumstances or just inefficiently costed cards, maybe cards that are more meant for constructed than limited. The Power Blade, just an equipment that's a little bit too expensive to get in play and equip. And then at the F tier, there's not a whole lot of unplayable cards in Limited these days, but they're often sideboard cards for Constructed. Taking a look at Calamity's Wake, some weird graveyard hate, these still end up in your Limited packs, so you'll just have to pass them or keep them in the sideboard instead. And then moving on, what I like to do is take a look at the archetype breakdown. So Phyrexia All Will Be One is mostly gonna have two color decks, maybe even some monocolored decks, and then a green has a little bit of potential for splashing a third or even fourth color. But for the most part you're gonna stick to these two color archetypes, so it's useful to take a look at the breakdown before we dive into the actual cards so you have a better idea of what every color combination is trying to accomplish in Limited. So blue-white is all about artifacts, artifact synergies, cards get better the more artifacts you have in play. Then red-white features the new Formiridin mechanic, which means you're gonna get a creature that's attached to an equipment already and you'll have a couple equipment synergies. Cards get better the more equipment you have. Maybe you get some discounts for equipping or playing equipment cards. So that's what a red-white wants to do. Then blue-black is a bit of a mixed bag. It has proliferate synergies. So the proliferate mechanic allowing you to add more counters to both your creatures as well as maybe the opponents since poison counters can indeed be proliferated. And then it also has more control elements than some of the other color pairs, since black of course tends to have quite a bit of removal in limited. Then black-green is the color pair that probably gives you one of the best chances of actually winning the game with poison counters. So as we'll see with the multicolor uncommon, it's gonna give you a few useful tools for actually poisoning the opponent to death. So if that's what you want to do in this set, then black-green might be the way to go. 
Then red green features a lot of cards with the oil counter mechanic and get a set of various abilities which will range all the way from maybe dealing one damage to destroying artifacts or enchantments to who knows what else. So oil counters are good and red green has a lot of them and has a few extra synergies with these oil counters. Then blue-red, as always, cares about non-creature spells, also has quite a few oil counters since it kind of overlaps with the red-green, as you can imagine, and then have a lot of uh, cards that benefit from casting non-creature spells, often in the form of receiving oil counters, which you can then use for other effects. Black-white, on the other hand, is going to try and poison the opponent, but not quite get to 10 poison counters to win the game. Instead, it will have quite a few cards that benefit from having 3 poison counters on the opponent, which is called the Corrupted Mechanic, so cards will get better if the opponent has 3 or more poison counters. So you're trying to poison the opponent just a little bit to get the most out of those cards. And then a Black Red always has a bit of a sacrifice theme in Limited. Maybe try and steal an opposing creature, sacrifice it, even if there's only one act of treason effect in the set. But it also still uses quite a few cards with oil counters and cards that just benefit from creatures dying in general. Then Green White is also a deck that could poison the opponent to death, since it features a lot of cards with a toxic mechanic that inflict the poison counters to begin with, and then it's generally also more aggressive color, so you will have more maybe combo tricks, ways to enhance power and toughness, etc. And then finally, blue-green is the color pair that will maybe proliferate to kill the opponent once you add a few poison counters initially, since you'll have a lot of cards with the proliferate mechanic, which can add more oil counters to the team, can add more poison counters to the opponent. Maybe you get lucky, open a planeswalker, and then you can add more loyalty counters as well. There's no plus one counters or minus one counters in the set, and of course they did that intentionally because you have the oil counters instead, and otherwise plus one counters would be a little bit too powerful with the proliferate mechanic in the set, but uh, still a lot of ways to gain leverage from the proliferate mechanic. Now we'll take a look at the multicolor cards to begin with, starting with Malkator, Purity Overseer, a 3 mana blue white 1 1 legendary Frexian Elephant Wizard at rare. And when the Overseer enters the battlefield, create a 3 3 colorless Frexian Golem artifact creature token. Okay, so that's a mouthful, but just taking a look at this first ability. We're basically paying 3 mana for a 1-1 one, one, and a 3-3 three, three artifact token, which maybe has more artifact synergy. So already, pretty decent card, can't complain. And then there's more at the beginning of your end step. If 3 or more artifacts entered the battlefield under your control this turn, create an additional 3-3 three, three colorless golem creature token. So powerful effect, although tricky to enable. So what's the best case scenario to get the additional golem? Maybe you wait until you can play the Overseer, play another one or two cheap artifacts, or maybe a card that makes multiple artifact tokens could also work. And then the Overseer making one golem counts as an artifact. Maybe we get to three total and we get an additional one. So that's what you're maybe trying to set up with the Overseer. But even without those additional uh, golem tokens, it's still a very good card. So Malkator gets a B grade, not quite a bomb level card, I would say, but still a card I'm very happy to first pick if there's nothing else in the pack and maybe guides us towards the blue-white archetype in Limited. Next up is the Cephalopod Sentry, another blue-white gold card here. This is an uncommon, 4 mana for 5 toughness on a flying creature whose power is equal to the number of artifacts we control. So itself being an artifact, it's going to be a 1-5 at the very least, and then the more artifacts we control, the better it gets. And yeah, this can very quickly kill the opponent if you've got uh, two or three artifacts in play. So it does not mess around, 5 toughness, pretty hard to kill. So an excellent uncommon, and definitely a reason to go into the blue-white artifact archetype. So we'll give this a B as well. Next up is Venser, Corpse Puppets, 2 mana, 1-3 Legendary Phyrexian, a zombie wizard at rare. So Venser is back, but not quite how we remembered him. So has a lifelink and toxic 1, so if a creature with toxic deals comma damage to the opponent, the opponent gets a poison counter equal to the toxic number. Most creatures in the set have toxic 1, there's a few with higher toxic numbers which we'll see too. And then, in this case, whenever we proliferate, we either get to generate a 3-3 colorless Frexian Golem artifact creature token that's named 
the Hollow Sentinel if we don't have one already. Or we can say target artifact creature we control gains flying and lifelink until end of turn. So we could maybe target the Hollow Sentinel if we have one already. So powerful ability if we get to proliferate, but even without a whole proliferate, we still get a 1-3 lifelink for 2 with toxic 1, so that's already pretty decent. So Fencer's quite powerful. Ideally, you can play it in a dedicated proliferate deck, but even if your deck only has like 3 or 4 proliferate cards, it's still definitely worth including. So Fencer also receives a B grade, not quite a bomb, but still very good. Next is Voidwing Hybrids, another blue-black card. This is a 2-1 Phyrexian Bat at Uncommon with Flying and Toxic 1. So whenever you see Toxic stapled onto a flying creature, it gets much better if you're actually trying to poison the opponent to death, as Evasion is a very big help. And then whenever we proliferate, we get to return the hybrid from our graveyard to our hand. So that's quite the payoff, just get a 2-1 flyer back each time. The opponent's kind of forced to eventually trade for the hybrid since it'll kill them. So unless they've got a bigger flyer that can just block it forever, or a reach creature, the hybrid's going to be a nightmare to deal with, assuming your deck has a few ways to proliferate. And uh, yeah, hybrid seems excellent as well, gets a B. A lot of these multicolor uncommons will get a B grade, but that's of course because they incentivize you to jump into a two-color pair, and uh, so the higher-powered cards are often multicolor. Next is Kaito Dancing Shadow, 4 mana for a 3 loyalty Planeswalker at rare. Now, interesting to notice, this set has quite a few Planeswalkers. The completed Planeswalkers, which you can maybe cast using Phyrexian mana, are all mythic. The non-completed Planeswalkers are all rare, so that's an interesting distinction. So Kaito is a rare and has an interesting passive ability, so those are back as well in this set saying whenever one or more creatures you control deal a combat damage to a player, you may return one of them to its owner's hand. If you do, you may activate loyalty abilities of Kaito twice this turn rather than only once. If you've got some cheap evasive creature ideally, you can maybe set that up, but let's say we ignore the passive ability for a second, we still have a very good set of abilities left over. Plus one gives you kind of a bit of protection or maybe a way to get past a large blocker because up to one target creature cannot attack or block until your next turn. Then the zero ability draws a card, great. And then the minus two makes a 2-2 drone artifact creature token with death touch. And when this creature leaves the battlefield, each opponent loses two life and you gain two life. Important that it says leaves the battlefield as opposed to dies. So that means if it gets exiled, it still drains the opponent. If you decide to pick it up with a passive ability, it will also still drain the opponent. And yeah, 2-2 two -two Death Touch is nice. Does not have flying, which, you know, we think of drones, we think of flyers. This one does not fly, but it is still an artifact creature. So it does still potentially enable some artifact synergies. So yeah, Kaito is kind of the full package, can draw cards, it can protect you, and it can uh, eventually win the game as well by making enough creatures. So I think this is a little bit shy of the S grade, but uh, it's definitely flirting with it, so I'll end up giving Kaito an A. Definitely a strong incentive to go blue-black. Next up is Char Forger, 3 mana, 2-3 Phyrexian Beast at Uncommon in red-black. So red-black we think sacrifice synergies, and this one does not disappoint in that regard. When it enters, create a 1-1 red Phyrexian Goblin creature token, and whenever another creature or artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put an oil counter on Char Forger, and we can remove three of those counters to exile the top card of our library, and we may play that card this turn. So it takes a while to accumulate the oil counters on Char Forger, but eventually does turn into card advantage, which is nice. And we still get a 2-3 and a 1-1 token for 3 mana, so that's quite a bit of power and toughness. So Char Forger seems pretty decent. Don't think it quite gets to the B range as we had with some of our author uncommons, but definitely worthy of a C+. Next is Kethak Crucible Goliath, 4 mana, 4-4, four, four, legendary Phyrexian beast at rare, and says at the beginning of your end step, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a non-legendary creature card with lesser mana value. Put it onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom in a random order. Sadly, it doesn't really work with creature tokens, since you have to get a card with lesser mana value. 
and mana value of most tokens is zero. So that's a bit disappointing. So best case scenario, you can combine this with like an act of treason effect that steals an opposing creature and then you sacrifice it to Kethek. Or maybe the opponent played an enchantment to remove one of your creatures. There's a couple in white and blue to keep your uh, creature locked down and then you can still get a bit of value out of it. So those are the kinds of synergies you want to look for. Otherwise, you're probably not too happy to sacrifice creatures unless they provide a nice ability when they uh, die, for instance. So yeah, 4 mana, 4-4 four, four with some useful abilities, but I'm not wild about Kethek, so I think it just falls in the C plus category. Then we've got a Migloss a Mace Crusher, 3 mana, 4-4 four, four, Legendary Phyrexian Beast at rare. So this is kind of the signpost for the Gruul archetype, which is all about oil counters and smashing face because Migloss enters the battlefield with five oil counters on it, and you can use them in a variety of ways. You can pay one mana, remove a single oil counter from Migloss to give it Vigilance and Menace until end of turn. You can remove two oil counters at the cost of two mana to give it plus two plus two until end of turn. And can pay three mana, remove three oil counters to destroy an artifact or enchantment. So yeah, if we can take out an opposing permanence with the three mana ability, and then still either pump it or maybe give it Vigilance and Menace over the course of two turns. We definitely got our uh, value out of our 3 mana 4-4, four, four, which is already above the curve. So this card seems great. And uh, of course there are a few other ways to maybe add more oil counters to our creatures. So that could maybe let us activate the various abilities even more. But I think it has enough going for it that I'm willing to give it bomb status. Next is Luca, Bound to Ruin, and this is our first example of a completed Planeswalker. So, as we said, these are all mythic, and can play Luca for 5 mana or 4 mana and 2 life. Although if we do cast it for 4 mana, then it will enter with 3 loyalty as opposed to 5. Has a plus 1 ability, adding red and green, that we can only spend to cast creature spells or activate abilities of creatures. The minus one creates a 3-3 Frexian Beast creature token with Toxic 1, and then the minus four deals X damage divided as we choose among any number of target creatures and or planeswalkers, where X is the greatest power among creatures we controlled as we activated this ability. So that's pretty neat that even if the opponent removes your largest creature, the minus four will still go off and deal a bunch of damage. So that's great. So yeah, Luca kind of does it all, helps you ramp, helps you provide a board presence with a minus one that you can activate multiple times and then the minus four gives you removal. So what more can you ask of your planeswalker that you can play as early as turn four? This I think is worthy of an S, should be able to carry you to victory in most games. Next up is the Cinder slash Ravager. Six mana, five five uncommon, Phyrexian warrior in red green still. And it costs one less to cast for each permanent you control with oil counters on it. Also has Vigilance, and when it enters the battlefield it deals one damage to each creature your opponents control. So it just keeps going, incredibly powerful. And uh, yeah, as we said, Red Green cares about oil counters, so hopefully you can play this for five mana, maybe even four mana. So that's kind of the dream case scenario. And dealing one damage to each creature your opponents control is also especially relevant in this set, as we'll see, because there's quite a few cards that generate 1-1 one, one Might tokens, and uh, being able to take those out in one fell swoop is quite nice as well. So yeah, the Ravager does not mess around, easily worthy of a B. And uh, if you've got uh, Ravager early in a draft, make sure to be on the lookout for those oil counters. Next is Melira, the Living Cure, 2 mana, 3-3 three, three, Legendary Human Scout at rare, saying if you would get one or more poison counters, instead you get one poison counter, and you cannot get additional poison counters this turn. Okay, I mean a lot of creatures in the sets have Toxic 1, not sure how many creatures would be hitting you at once, so that first ability feels not incredibly relevant, but I guess it helps if you're facing some of the more dedicated poison decks. And then we can also exile Melira, choose another target creature or artifact, and when it's put into a graveyard this turn, return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. So that's the real uh, moneymaker here, being able to save a more important creature later in the game, 
and we already get a 2 mana 3 3 which is slightly above the curve so yeah Malira seems totally fine and a card I'm happy to give a C plus not quite in the B tier but if you're already green white then this is an excellent addition to your deck next is the slaughter singer 2 mana 2-2 two, two, Frex and Cleric at Uncommon in green white this one has toxic 2 so if this one deals common damage to the opponent, they get two poison counters as opposed to one, which is a pretty significant difference. And whenever another creature you control with toxic attacks, it gets plus one plus one until end of turn. So yeah, as we saw in the archetype breakdown, green-white is toxic aggro. So you've got your toxic creatures, maybe some 1-1 one -one toxic tokens as well that you can boost up with the singer. And uh, the singer itself doesn't even have to be attacking to grant the bonus. So kind of an excellent anthem effect for your toxic decks. And if the singer itself can get in there a few times, you could maybe realistically still poison the opponent to death. So yeah, singer's excellent and gets a B. Next up we have Rhea Ivor, Bane of Bladehold. 4 mana, 3-4 legendary Phyrexian Knight at rare. With Battle Cry, this may be the only card with a Battle Cry mechanic in the set. So whenever a creature with Battle Cry attacks, each other attacking creature gets plus one plus O oh until end of turn. So an ability that plays well in kind of a go wide strategy, where you can make lots of tokens or ideally have some evasive creatures that can keep attacking. And then there's more. At the beginning of combat on your turn, the next time target creature would deal combat damage to one or more players this combat, prevent that damage, and if damage is prevented this way, create that many 1-1 one -one Colossus Phyrexian Might Artifact Creature Tokens with Toxic 1 and the ability that it cannot block. I'm not going to keep repeating the whole ability of these Phyrexian Might since it's always the same. A 1-1, one -one, it cannot block and it has Toxic 1 and it's also an artifact for those artifact synergies. Uh, you get to attack with it, you have to decide before damage is dealt which creature is not going to deal combat damage to the opponent, and then the opponent can still decide how they block. The Bane of Blade Hold itself doesn't get the battle cry bonus, so it's just a 3-4 attacking, so not the most difficult creature for the opponent to take out, so you may only be able to attack with it once or twice. So it feels like a lot of setup to maybe get some 1-1 one -one tokens, which admittedly would play well with the battle cry if you can keep attacking, but how often can you realistically keep attacking with the Bane of Blade Hold without the opponent either killing it or having enough blockers back? So I'm not really sold on um, the Bane of Blade Hold, so I'm gonna give it a conservative C+. Then we've got the Vivisection Evangelist, 5 mana for a 4-4 uncommon in black-white with Vigilance, and the first instance of Corrupted, so when it enters a battlefield, if an opponent has three or more poison counters, in this case we get to destroy target creature or planeswalker an opponent controls. So an amazing ability if you can get it off, but it requires a little bit of setup of course, getting three poison counters on the opponent may be a little bit more challenging than it appears. So best case scenario, your one or two drop can inflict some poison, Maybe you've got a flying creature with Toxic that can get to 3 poison by turn 5. And uh, then the Evangelist is amazing. If the opponent uh, can prevent you from getting the poison counters, you're left with a 4-4 Vigilance for 5. Which is not the worst card in the world, but uh, definitely a lot less exciting than a creature that destroys something else when it enters. So Evangelist, I think, is still a card I'm happy to take early, but it does require me to significantly prioritize early toxic and poison enablers to uh, get the corrupted mechanic online. So I'm willing to give it a B, but just uh, don't expect the evangelist to be amazing if you don't build your deck around it properly. Next is Kaya, Intangible Slayer, another Planeswalker. This one is not corrupted, so just a rare. Seven mana is a pretty hefty price tag, but has a ton of powerful abilities that will dominate a game of limited, starts out with 6 loyalty and also has hexproof as its kind of passive ability, so opposing removal spells won't be able to take it out or target it, and then the plus 2 drains the opponent for 3, gaining 3, the 0 ability lets us draw 2 cards, even if the opponent does get to scry 1, who cares, 
and then the minus three says exile target creature or enchantment and if it wasn't an aura create a token that's a copy of it except it's a one one white spirit creature token with flying in addition to its other types so not only do we get to exile which is already better than destroying in a set with a few indestructible effects out there can also hit enchantment and we also get a one one spirit that maybe absorbs some useful abilities so yeah, Kaya does not mess around, incredibly powerful Planeswalker, if you can cast it, it should win you the game, so I think it's worthy of an S, even if it's maybe not going to be the best card in a set overall, because it is 7 mana, some games have limited, you may be dead before you get to 7 mana, but assuming you can cast her, she's definitely worth it. Next is a Serum Core Chimera. So our first blue-red card, this is a 4 mana, 2-4, with flying at uncommon, and says whenever we cast a non-creature spell, put an oil counter on the Chimera. This is an effect we'll see pretty often in the blue-red archetype, getting additional oil counters whenever we cast non-creature spells. And then we can remove three oil counters from it, so it does take quite a while to get there. But between casting non-creature spells, and of course we can also proliferate to maybe put more oil counters on the Chimera, it uh, is still quite realistic to get to three oil counters, at which point we get to draw a card, and then we may discard a non-land card. When we discard a card this way, doesn't matter which card it is, as long as it's a non-land card, the Chimera deals three damage to a creature or planeswalker, and can only be used at sorcery speed. Definitely need to make sure your deck has enough non-creature spells to enable it. Hesitant to give this one a B, just because of the amount of oil counters you need to really get it going, so I'll go with a C+, plus, but uh, could easily end up uh, falling in the B tier instead, especially if your deck has a nice density of proliferate as well. Next is Ovika, Enigma, Goliath, 7 mana, 6-6, six, six, Legendary, Phyrexian, Nightmare at rare, has Flying and Ward, which makes the opponent both pay 3 life and 3 mana if they want to target it with removal. It's got a bit of built-in protection, although by the time you can cast a 7 mana creature, the opponent probably doesn't have any issues paying the Ward 3. And then, whenever we cast a non-creature spell, create X11 red Phyrexian Goblin creature tokens, where X is the mana value of that spell. They also gain haste until end of turn, and then they'll stay in play. 7 mana, again pretty pricey, and while the ward is nice, it's definitely a significant upside. I don't expect it to necessarily prevent the opponent from taking out Ovika if they have an answer left over, but a 6-6 six, six is also not the easiest creature to kill to begin with, and then it flies, so it will definitely take out the opponent in a couple attacks. And then uh, in the meantime, maybe you've got some goblin tokens that can chum block on the ground. So, very powerful card, not quite an S tier, but certainly a bomb, so we'll give it an A. Next is Glissa, Sunslayer, our first black-green card. 3 mana for a 3-3 three, three Phyrexian a zombie elf with first strike and death touch. Glissa, a character we've seen in uh, previous Phyrexia sets, so she's back. And uh, yeah, 3-3, three, three, first strike, death touch. Those are amazing stats. First strike and death touch makes it almost impossible for the opponent to attack past it unless the opponent has some evasive creatures. And then if this is attacking, good luck trying to take it out by blocking. So a complete nightmare on the battlefield. And then there's more. Whenever Glissa deals combat damage to a player, we either get to draw a card at the cost of one life, we can destroy an enchantment, or we can remove up to three counters from a target permanent. So that includes maybe oil counters that the opponent may have, that includes uh, loyalty counters from uh, planeswalkers as well. So definitely a relevant ability and uh, easily bomb status, despite being relatively small in size. The effects here quickly add up. And next is Tyvar, a jubilant brawler. Sometimes hard to read the names of these cards when the art overlaps, but pretty sure that's a brawler. Three mana for a three loyalty planeswalker at rare. This one has not been completed yet. And the passive says you may activate abilities of creatures you control as though those creatures had haste. The plus one untaps up to one target creature. The minus two mills three cards, and then you may return a creature with mana value two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Not all that exciting for limited. This feels more like it goes in a constructed elf deck where you can immediately tap your elves for mana, maybe get some important two mana elves back from the graveyard. 
but as far as uh, limited is concerned, not that many creatures with abilities you need to activate right away, not that many mana creatures either, and then getting back a creature with mana value 2 or less in limited also means you're not getting back something incredibly exciting. So overall, Tyvar feels a bit lackluster, uh, giving pseudo vigilance to your creatures with a plus one, but then you're not really working up towards a significant ultimate either. So I think some black green decks may still play it, especially if you have some valuable two or one drops to get back, but uh, it's not a card I would go out of my way first picking. Feels more like a card that will sometimes make the cut, sometimes it doesn't, which is kind of the definition of a C. Next is the Necrogen Rot Priest, 4 mana, 1, 5, Phyrexian, a zombie, cleric, at uncommon with toxic, 2. So now we're talking, and a 1, 5 is kind of the perfect stat line to have a high toxic number, because you at that point probably don't care about dealing actual damage, you just care about poisoning the opponent, so we don't need more than one power. And then whenever a creature we control with toxic deals combat damage to a player, that player gets an additional poison counter. Okay, so yeah, if this one deals damage to the opponent, it doesn't say author creature, so it deals three poison counters at once. Now of course a 1-5 should technically be pretty easy to block, but there's more. For one, a black and a green, target creature you control with toxic gains death touch until end of turn, so now your 1-5 can have death touch, so it becomes a lot harder for the opponent to easily take it out. And uh, yeah, hopefully you've got other toxic creatures in your deck to combine with the Rot Priest's ability. So the Rot Priest itself doesn't necessarily have to attack for those effects to be useful. Yeah, willing to give this a B for sure. Then we have Jor Kadin, first Gold Warden as our first red-white card. And as we know, red-white cares about the Formiridon equipment mechanic. And uh, yeah, that's what we'll see with Jor Kadin as well. 2 mana, 2-2, two, two, legendary human rebel at rare, has trample, and whenever Jor Kadin attacks, it gets plus X, plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of equipped creatures you control. And then Jor Kadin, if it has power 4 or greater, also draws a card. Of course, it needs to attack in order to start drawing cards. So that's maybe... A bit of a concern if the opponent can take it out, but hopefully you'll at least get to draw a card on the way out. There's a few equipment that can also give flying, so those would be perfect to pair with it so you can keep drawing over and over again. And then the fail case is you get a 2-2 trampler for two, which is not exciting, but hopefully you've got at least a few equipment in the deck to enhance it. So I think C plus for Jor Kadin, a card I'm happy to take if I'm already in the red-white deck. Not sure if this is the card that convinces me to jump ship if I've maybe got some cards in other colors. Bladehold War Whip is a 3 mana artifact equipment at Uncommon with the 4 Mirrodin mechanic. So while it's not a creature itself, it does come with a 2-2 red rebel creature token and then the equipment will attach to that token right away. In this case, the equipped creature has double strike, so we're paying 3 mana for a 2-2 double strike. Not bad. And then it also says equip abilities you activate of other equipment costs one generic less to activate. That's also useful. And even if the opponent kills the rebel token that's attached to the war whip, then we still have that one mana discount potentially. So yeah, not the easiest to move around, but it will still discount other equipment. So hopefully you've got a few other for Mirrodin type equipment to go with it. Gets at least a C plus. Not quite a B, because it is quite pricey to re-equip to give Double Strike, but of course Double Strike itself as an ability is incredibly powerful. Next we have Nahiri, the Unforgiving, and this one unfortunately has been completed, so it is a mythic, can be played for 4 mana or 3 mana and 2 life, in which case it enters with 3 loyalty as opposed to 5, and has two different plus one abilities. The first one says until your next turn, up to one target creature attacks a player each combat if able. So in a weird way, it also kind of protects Nahiri because the opponent won't be able to attack your planeswalker. So that's kind of interesting. 
And then the second plus one lets you discard and draw, so it just lets you loot to maybe also set up the final ability, which is a zero ability, saying exile target creature or equipment card with mana value less than Nahiri's loyalty from your graveyard, and then create a token that's a copy of it, that token gains haste, and exile it at the beginning of the next end step. So in limited, we can maybe combine that with the Formiridon equipment, get the extra 2-2 Rebel token, and then even if end of turn we have to get rid of the equipment, we'll still have the 2-2 token left over. So that's pretty neat. Maybe we've got some nice creatures with an ETB effect that we can uh, get back from the graveyard. So it has some neat synergies. We can play it as early as turn 3, which in limited is quite powerful, especially if you're on the play, the opponent doesn't have a whole lot of a board to pressure your Planeswalker. And then, at the very least, you get to improve your hand each turn, adding more loyalty until you can maybe get something back from the graveyard. So, Nahiri, I think, will give a B. Not quite a bomb, but I think better than it looks. Next is the Tainted Observer. 3 mana for a 2-3 Phyrexian Bird at Uncommon in blue-green. So our first blue-green card. And it flies, which is great, because it also has Toxic 1, so that's an easy way to help deal with those poison counters, and then whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay two generic mana if you do proliferate. Wow, so in the late game, every creature, hopefully you've got at least one initial poison counter on the opponent, so then every future creature you pay the two extra mana, which also represents an extra poison counter, maybe you've got some oil counters as well, and uh, yeah, that can quickly add up. And you just need to cast creatures, which is what Limit is all about. So it's not like you have to jump through some crazy hoops to get there. And then a 2-3 Flyer with Toxic 1 for 3 is already pretty decent. So yeah, the Observer seems awesome, gets a B. Next is Azuri, Stalker of Spheres. So Azuri is back. 4 mana for a 3-3 Legendary Phyrexian Elf Warrior at rare. And when Azuri enters the battlefield, we can pay 3 generic mana, if we do, proliferate twice, and whenever we proliferate, draw a card. So we can play Azuri for 7 mana total, in which case we immediately draw 2 cards, and of course we also get to proliferate twice, which could be great. But we can also play Azuri at 4 mana, and then we might have some other proliferate effects that help us draw. So yeah, Azuri seems pretty decent, and... Uh, as long as you can generate enough mana, it should be an amazing mana sink in the late game. Blue-green is all about proliferating. So this one falls somewhere between a B and an A. So I'll go with a higher upside A, since uh, hopefully the set is slow enough where you can actually get to the 7 mana. But uh, yeah, if the set ends up being a little bit more aggressive, I could see this falling down to the B grade instead. Next we have Atraxa Grand Unifier. This one is the only non-two-color card in the set. It's three, a green, a white, a blue, and a black. So all colors except for red. So seven mana total for a 7-7 seven, seven legendary Phyrexian Angel and Mythic with Flying, Vigilance, Death Dutch, and Lifelink. Wow, and there's more. When Atraxa enters the battlefield, reveal the top 10 cards of your library for each card type you may put a card of that type among the revealed cards into your hand, and the rest goes on the bottom. And to reiterate, card types include lands, creatures, there's a lot of those in limited, artifacts are also plentiful in this set, enchantments, you might have a few removal spells that are enchantments, planeswalkers if you're lucky enough, you can maybe grab a planeswalker, and then instant and sorcery of course, which are not plentiful in limited, you might have a handful, so... Getting to look at 10 of those cards gives you a pretty high chance of grabbing at least 3 or 4 different cards from it. So that's amazing, and of course you still have a 7-7 seven, seven Flying Vigilance Death Touch lifelink. So this card's amazing, but of course the challenge is having all 4 of those colors, which is going to be tricky. There's a few cards that can fix your mana, mostly in green. There's a few, like... Uh, Multicolor lands, there's like Thermorphic Expanse, which can fetch any basic, but there's not a ton of uh, cycles of dual lands, for instance, at common, like you might have in other limited environments. Casting Atraxa is a challenge, 
but I think if you're base green, then it becomes a little bit easier since there's a few other green effects that let you search up uh, different lanes or fix your mana. So if you open a Traxa, I would definitely take it since it's a ton of fun. And then I would look to be base green, but uh, still an absolute bomb and definitely gonna first pick it if I uh, get the chance. First white card is the Crawling Chorus. And as you've noticed, I'm going from lowest mana value to highest mana value in the set review. So that also maybe gives you an idea of how aggressive the format could be, since you'll get to see all the cheap creatures first, and then we'll slowly build up to higher mana values. The Crawling Chorus is a 1-1 Phyrexian Horror at common. So expect to see a lot of these. Has Toxic 1, so a great way to enable the Corrupted mechanic early on. And when the Crawling Chorus dies, create a 1-1 Might creature token. This seems pretty good. Can play it early, can maybe use it as sacrifice fodder in decks that need that. Get your Corrupted synergies online, will fit nicely in the green-white Toxic aggro deck. So it feels like a solid role player across uh, different archetypes. The set's also going to be built in such a way that there's enough ways to block 1-1 tokens easily. So if the opponent plays a 1-2 or a 2-2 on turn 2, then uh, you do need ways to keep the chorus attacking, otherwise it's uh, just going to sit there, and then even though the chorus itself can chum block, the might cannot, so it's not the best defensive creature necessarily. So overall, I think chorus gets a C. Some decks may value it a lot more than others, especially I think the corrupted decks that just need to deal those few points of uh, poison damage, but then are okay with maybe sacrificing it later. That's probably the best home for the chorus. But uh, yeah, could see this show up in quite a few different decks. Don't think it's quite a C plus necessarily, but uh, time will tell how valuable this one ends up being. But I'll start with a C. Some decks like it, some decks don't. Next is a Sinew Dancer, 1 mana, 1-1 one, one Phyrexian Soldier at common. 3 and a white to tap the Dancer and tap target creature. That's incredibly expensive for a tap ability, but with Corrupted, if we get uh, 3 poison counters on the opponent, we can activate this for just a single white as opposed to 3 and a white. Tap the Dancer to tap target creature. So if it always costs a single white to tap, then it would be quite powerful. Definitely seen these effects in the past in Limited, and they're always very good. But costing 4 mana, that's a no for me. And uh, yeah, while this could help you enable the Corrupted effect, it's just a little bit too pricey to get there in the first place, I'm afraid. So I think Dancer is not going to make the cut in most decks, and I'm going to go as low as a D for Dancer. Next we have the Defector Might, 1 mana, 1-1 one, one Legendary Phyrexian Might at rare has Toxic 1, and like all other Mites, this one also cannot block, but we can pay either 2 life or 1 white mana to tap the Defector Might and then choose a color, another target creature you control against Toxic 1 and Hexproof from that color until end of turn. And it also cannot be blocked by creatures of that color this turn. So it's as close as it gets to protection, there's a few things that are different from it, but uh, yeah, can think of it as protection, can help your creatures get through for damage, can protect from removal, so it's quite versatile. And of course, as a 1-1 with Toxic 1, can also maybe help you enable the Corrupted mechanic early. Yeah, might actually go up to a B for Defector Might, it has enough going for it. If you draw it late, it can be a bit disappointing, but it still offers some nice utility at maybe protecting your key creatures. So yeah, we'll go with B for the Might. Swooping Lookout, 1 mana for a 1-2 artifact creature, Phyrexian Construct at Uncommon. Pretty strange to see a 1 mana 1-2 at Uncommon, but it has Flying and Vigilance. Now I think the reason why this one is Uncommon is because the 1-1 one, one Mites are everywhere, and a 1-2 of course a perfect way to block them. Flying Vigilance, so you can attack and block at the same time, and it's also an artifact creature, so it can help enable your artifact synergies, especially in blue-white. As a flyer, it also carries equipment nicely for the red-white deck, so it actually has quite a few synergies across multiple archetypes. This may even uh, sneak up into the C+. Not sure if it's quite a B, but I wouldn't be surprised, since it seems quite desirable in a lot of different decks. 
But of course, at the end of the day, it is still just a 1-2, so not the highest impact card. But for a deck that wants to curve out, that's more aggressively slanted, these uh, one mana, one powered flyers often end up overperforming. A Zealot's Conviction is a one mana for an enchantment aura at common that can be played at instant speed thanks to flash. Enchants a creature, giving it plus one plus one. But if we have corrupted enabled, then that creature gets an additional plus one plus two and first strike. Well, this one is either amazing for one mana or kind of mediocre. I feel like this is a type of card that goes super late in the pack that uh, might be the last pick, so you shouldn't have to prioritize them. And I think most decks are probably better off without it. The decks that really want it should be able to get it. So yeah, we'll give this a D. I don't think it's a very important card, but uh, yeah, definitely be on the lookout for one mana comma tricks if you're facing the corrupted deck. Next is Bladed Ambassador, one and a white for a 3-1 Frexen Soldier at Uncommon. Enters with an oil counter on it, can pay one mana, remove an oil counter to give it indestructible until end of turn. So it's a one-time indestructible unless you've got a way to add more oil counters to it on a 3-1. So one toughness, not the best in a set with a lot of mites. So better off attacking with it as opposed to blocking, which you're probably interested in anyway. Going to be quite nice in the equipment deck as something you don't mind equipping since at least you can save your investment for one mana. A two drop with quite a bit of extra potential is always nice to have. So this feels like a C plus. Then a complete devotion, one and a white for an instant at common, giving target creature we control plus two plus two until end of turn. If the creature has toxic, we also get to draw a card. A nice comma trick for the dedicated poison and toxic decks. So I'm thinking green-white probably wants this, black-white might be interested, but a red-white equipment deck for instance probably doesn't need this. So yeah, it kind of depends in which archetype you fall. Doesn't seem like an incredibly high priority card to take, but the decks that want it should be able to pick it up if they want a comma trick. This seems pretty good, but for now, Duelist of Deep Faith, one and a white for a 2-2 Frexen Soldier at common with Toxic 1. As long as it's our turn, the Duelist has First Strike. So kind of your bread and butter 2-drop. Attacks pretty well, not necessarily the best on defense, but most of these white Toxic decks seem to be aggressively slanted. So yeah, this seems like a fine role player. Some decks may want it, some decks may not. There's definitely better 2-drops out there, but compared to your Typical 2-mana two 2-2, two -two. this definitely has a few extra abilities. So C for Duelist. Then we've got the Incisor Glider. A 1-3 Flyer with Corrupted, saying if the Glider attacks, if an opponent has 3 or more Poison Counters, creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. This seems like a pretty powerful payoff card for the Corrupted mechanic. Of course, enabling it, as always, is going to be the challenge. The glider itself doesn't have toxic, but paired with some cheap toxic creatures, like the 1-1 we saw earlier, this could deal a lot of extra damage. So it seems quite decent. I'll go with a C plus for glider. Infested Flashcutter, one and white for a equipment at Uncommon. This is one of the few equipment in the set that doesn't have the Formiridon mechanic, but it does give plus 2 plus 0, and whenever the equipped creature attacks, create a 1-1 one, one Might creature token, and we can equip for 2 and a white. So this does seem incredibly expensive to play and equip. 5 mana total to give plus 2 plus 0, and hopefully start generating Mites if we can attack. I'm kind of lukewarm on the Flesh Cutter, just feels prohibitively expensive. While there may be some ways to discount the cost in red-white, it's still not a card that should be prioritized, and the red-white decks can probably easily pick it up late in the pack, so we'll give it a D. Jawbone Duelist, one and a white for a 1-1 Frexen Soldier at Uncommon, with Double Strike and Toxic 1. Pretty simple, but pretty effective, since Double Strike means we can potentially inflict two poison counters in one combat step, so that's neat. Plays very well with other equipment that increase its power, good with combat tricks. So this definitely seems like one of the best two drops in white so far. And we'll give it a B. 
Kemba, the Enduring, is 1 in white for a 2-2 Legendary Cat Cleric at a rare, and says equipped creatures we control get plus 1 plus 1, so that can also apply to Kemba itself. And whenever Kemba or another cat enters a battlefield under our control, attach up to one target equipment we control to that creature. Okay, that's pretty neat. That's one way to equip those more expensive things. And then for three and double white, we get to make a 2-2 white cat creature token. So an excellent mana sync. The cat creature token can also enable the first ability to equip something for free. And the plus one plus one bonus, also very relevant in the dedicated equipment decks. And at the end of the day, it's still a 2 mana 2-2. Two -two. So this card seems great and a nice incentive for the equipment deck. So happy to first pick and then maybe pivot into red-white. So we'll give it a B. Not quite a bomb, but uh, yeah, if games do end up being pretty long, then I could see the mana sink taking over the late game. 5 mana for a 2-2 two -two is still pretty expensive, but nice ability to have for sure. Mandible Justicer, I want to say, 2 mana, 2-1 two, artifact creature, Frexing Cleric at common with a lifelink. And whenever another artifact enters a battlefield under our control, the Mandible gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. Decent 2-drop with lifelink. And in the dedicated artifact decks, maybe a card that makes multiple might tokens can pump this up a few times. It's going to make it hard for the opponent to race. Plays well in the equipment decks as... A lifelink creature that we wouldn't mind giving more power and toughness, maybe give it flying, that would be the dream. But at the end of the day, one toughness, even if you pump it once, it's still gonna trade for most opposing two drops most of the time. So it's probably gonna just sit there in play until you can actually give it a significant bonus and then it can maybe make up for it. So at the end of the day, I think it's still just a C, but uh, some decks may be very interested in it. Norn's Wellspring, one and a white for a rare artifact. And whenever a creature we control dies, we get to scry one and put an oil counter on the Wellspring. Can pay one mana, tap it, remove two oil counters from the Wellspring to draw a card. So it takes a little bit to get your card back from the Wellspring. Getting to scry in the meantime is nice. But the question is, what deck really needs it? Doesn't fit into the equipment deck. The Corrupted deck maybe has a bit of Sacrifice synergy that wouldn't mind the Wellspring, but even that's questionable. The Green-White Toxic deck probably doesn't really need this. So, yeah, I'm kind of struggling. I guess it's an artifact for the Blue-White Artifact deck, but how many creatures are dying in that deck when most of them fly doesn't really have a home. If this were like a Black or Red card, it would probably be better, since it plays better into the Red-Black Sacrifice deck. So at the end of the day, Wellspring, I think, just gets a C. Some decks may want it, especially if they lack other sources of card advantage, but I'm not overly impressed. Then we've got Ossification. This card does not mess around. One and white for an enchantment aura and uncommon. Has to enchant a basic land, but that's not a problem in Limited. And then when it enters, it exiles a creature or planeswalker an opponent controls until Ossification leaves the battlefield. So amazing removal spell for two mana. Easily gets a B. Planar Disruption, one and a white for a common aura, enchants an artifact, creature, or planeswalker, and then the enchanted permanent cannot attack, block, and its activated abilities cannot be activated. So we're used to having these effects for three mana, this one's just two mana. So yeah, this seems amazing too. Easily gets a B as well. I think ossification's still better, but of course this is a common, ossification's uncommon but I'll happily play both. Gets a B. Resistance Reunited is one and a white for an instant at uncommon, saying target creature gets plus two plus two until end of turn, and equipped creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn. So could maybe have multiple equipped creatures that all become indestructible. So another nice comma trick for the red-white equipment deck. Outside of it, most decks probably don't care. So not a card that should be prioritized in the draft, but uh, yeah, gets a C. The red-white decks will be happy to play it. Then we've got Skrelv's Hive, two mana rare enchantment, saying at the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life and create a 1-1 one -one might, and with Corrupted, as long as an opponent has three or more poison counters, creatures you control with Toxic also have lifelink. 
So it sort of enables itself. You build up an army of mites, they attack, hopefully poison the opponent a few times, and then all of a sudden your mites gain lifelink to make up for lost life. And hopefully you've got other ways to enhance their power and toughness, or you've got some other poison synergies. So the hive seems pretty good. Uh, it takes a while to get going, so if you top deck it late, it's not the most exciting draw necessarily. But on turn 2, this could do some serious damage in the more dedicated poison decks. So I'll go with B for Hive. Not quite a bomb, but uh, definitely a card I'm still happy to first pick and try and build around. Next is the Veil of Assimilation. 2 mana, uncommon artifact. Not an equipment, just an artifact that uh, kind of stays in play. And when it enters, or another artifact enters the battlefield under our control, target creature we control gets plus one plus one and gains a vigilance until end of turn. It's a pretty bizarre card, and it doesn't seem particularly powerful either. Plus one plus one and vigilance. Best case scenario, you're playing a bunch of cards that generate multiple artifacts at once, but it's not like there's a ton of those. So, yeah, feels a bit underwhelming. Maybe the super dedicated blue-white artifact decks will still play it. But uh, yeah, it does not seem particularly great to me, so I'll go with D for Veil. Then we've got Annex Sentry, 3 mana for a 1-4 artifact creature, Phyrexian Cleric at Uncommon with Toxic 1, and this has kind of the Banisher Priest effect. When it enters, we can exile both creatures or artifacts as well, with mana value 3 or less, until the Sentry leaves the battlefield. And yeah, 1-4 is not the easiest to take out necessarily, Toxic one could also be relevant, so overall a pretty decent card and gets a B. Happy to play it in all white decks even if I don't have any synergy with it, but between it being an artifact and having Toxic it kind of checks all the boxes, so it should have some additional synergy in your deck as well. Then we've got Charge of the Mites, two and a white for an instant, at common can either make two Might tokens or deal damage to an opposing creature equal to the number of creatures we control. I guess it also hits Planeswalkers. So we've seen that effect before. Kabira Takedown, I believe Cabaretti Charm also did something similar. And then have the flexibility of just making two mites instead. Of course, mites cannot block, so it's not like you're going to ambush anyone with them. But you can maybe make them end of turn and then still get some toxic damage in. So a Charge of the Mites seems decent. Fits into the green-white toxic decks. It's a way to make two artifacts at instant speed for an artifact deck, which could also be relevant. So it fits into a lot of different decks, and of course you can still use it as removal in a deck with a sufficient number of creatures. So I think C plus for Charge of the Mites. Then we've got the Flancing Raptor, two and a white for a 2-2 Phyrexian Bird at common with Flying and Toxic 1. So Flying and Toxic pair very nicely together. And when it enters the battlefield, another target creature we control with Toxic gets plus one plus one and gains flying until end of turn. So a great way for the mites to get through and deal a bit of poison. So yeah, the raptor seems quite good. Easily gets a C plus. Then the Gold Warden's Helm is another four Mirrodin equipment, two and a white to give an extra point of toughness. So we get a two three basically, and then we can move the helm for one and a white. Yeah, seems like a totally fine card, gets a C, the equipment decks will be happy to have it. The artifact decks probably are happy to have this one as well, as an extra artifact. And it plays defense quite well, can maybe move the helm later if you need to. But uh, not the most impactful effect, just one extra point of toughness. Then the Leonin Lightbringer, 2 and a white for a 3-2 Cat Rebel at common, with Ward 2. And... As long as it's equipped, it gets plus one, plus one. This will play well in the red-white decks, with a bit of built-in protection, so you don't mind loading some equipment onto it, since it'll be a little bit more expensive for the opponent to take out. And then getting the extra plus one, plus one is nice too. So outside of the equipment decks, pretty lackluster. Three mana, three two is uh, not what it used to be. But in red-white specifically, it should be fine. So that's a C. Next we have Vanish into Eternity, some epic art for a 2 and a white instant at common, which exiles target a non-land permanent, but it can also hit creatures if we pay 6 mana total. 
So three mana for non-creatures, six mana to exile creatures at instant speed. Quite pricey, but there are a decent number of non-creature permanents that we wouldn't mind exiling. There's a lot of artifacts, couple powerful enchantments, planeswalkers too. So I think you're going to be happy to have the first copy of Vanish into Eternity, regardless of how the rest of your deck looks like. But uh, yeah, I think C plus still for Vanish. Happy with the first one. Second one is kind of borderline. Next up is Against All Odds. Three and a white for an uncommon sorcery. Saying choose one or both. Exile target artifact or creature you control. Return it to the battlefield under Soner's control. So basically flicker a creature. Or we can return an artifact or creature card with mana value three or less from our graveyard to the battlefield. Flickering in this set, while there are a few nice ETB effects, definitely not worth four mana and a whole card. And then returning a cheap permanent, also not really worth four mana and a card. So this one gets a D. Hex Gold, Hover Wings, three and a white for an uncommon equipment with four Mirrodin. Equipped creature has flying, and creatures you control that are equipped get plus one plus zero. Oh. So we basically get a three two flyer for 4 mana, and then the Hover Wings equip for 2 and a white, so not prohibitively expensive, and flying one of the better keywords. The Hover Wings can have an immediate impact when you play it by maybe pumping a different creature that's already equipped. So this seems like one of the best payoffs for the equipment deck, at least at Uncommon, so easily a B for Hover Wings. Indoctrination Attendant is 3 and a white for a 3-4 Frexian Cleric at common with Toxic 1, and when it enters the battlefield you may return another permanent you control to its owner's hand, if you do make a 1-1 Might. Ideal if the opponent has an enchantment holding your creature down, then you can pick it back up and replay it later, get a Might in the process. Maybe it's still fine to just pick up your 2-drop again, which may not be doing much, and then get the extra 1-1 token. Yeah, this one seems fine, just nothing special, gets a C, but if I have one of these in my sideboard and I'm playing against an opponent with a lot of auras as removal, then I would definitely consider playing additional copies. Then we've got a Mythic, a Mondrak, Glory Dominus, 4 mana for a 4-4 Legendary Phyrexian Horror, and if one or more tokens would be created under your control, twice that many are created instead, and then we can sacrifice two author artifacts and or creatures to put an indestructible counter on it. So two artifacts or creatures shouldn't be too difficult if you're playing a deck that can generate a lot of mites. And then uh, yeah, making it indestructible is a relevant upside. Although of course there are still ways to get rid of it once it's indestructible, between exiling it, uh, decreasing its toughness down to zero will do it too. And uh, there's a few ways to maybe make you sacrifice a creature which could also get rid of it. So you have to be pretty sure that Indestructible is worth it before you invest all the mana and maybe life into it. But against, let's say, a red-green deck, you should be safe with Indestructible. So what do we think of Mondrak? Doubling tokens seems quite powerful in a set with a lot of mites. Can't think of too many treasures or other tokens in the set. So it's mainly mites we're trying to double. But at the end of the day, it's still a 4-4 for 4 mana that can maybe become indestructible, which is already quite powerful even without additional synergy. So yeah, I think this is a bomb. If you take it early, you should be able to pick up a ton of token makers, and then uh, should be able to go wide to take out the opponent pretty easily. Next is the Orthodoxy Enforcer, 3 and a white for a 2-4 Cleric, Phyrexian as well at common has Vigilance, and gets plus 2 plus 0 as long as you control 2 or more artifacts. 4-4 four, four Vigilance for 4 at common seems pretty good. Need to jump through a few hoops to enable it, but uh, yeah, like the art depicts, 2 Might tokens will do it. Pretty good, I think C+. Plus. And a 2-4 for Vigilance for 4 is also not the worst. Next we have the Phyrexian Vindicator, quadruple white for a 5-5 five, five. Phyrexian Horror at Mythic with Flying saying if damage would be dealt to it, prevent the damage, and redirect that damage to any other target. We probably wouldn't be playing this outside of a mono-white deck, so that's the main challenge with uh, picking this early, is that it kind of forces you to go mono-white, but uh, 
it may be worth it since this card's amazing. Of course, can still be answered by some other effects, like the various enchantments we've seen. There's ways to exile it. In some games, especially against red-green, once again, this is going to be a nightmare for the opponent to deal with, and a 5-5 flyer can also just close out the game very quickly. Worthy of bomb status, not quite an S, since it's still a little tricky to cast, and there are still answers to it, but uh, easily gets an A. Next is the Porcelain Zealot, 3 and a white for a 2-3. Frexen Soldier at Uncommon, saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, a creature we control gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. If that creature has Toxic, it gets plus 2 plus 2 instead. Okay, so in the dedicated Toxic decks, meaning probably uh, green-white and black-white, Zealot should be quite effective. Getting the immediate plus 2 plus 2 the turn we play, it kind of feels like it has haste, at least part of it. And uh, a 2-3, while not the most impressive creature, can still block some smaller stuff from the opponent, while you can attack with maybe your flying creature, could also easily benefit from the extra power and toughness. We'll give it a C+. Then the Basilica, Shepherd, 5 mana, 3-3, three, three, Frexen Angel at common with flying, and when it enters, create two Might tokens. Okay, this is a common, so this seems amazing. Relatively large flyer, makes two tokens, good for the toxic decks, good for the artifact decks, and the equipment deck is probably happy with this as well, since it provides multiple bodies for you to equip. So this is the type of common that kind of goes into every white archetype, and uh, the stats are good. So I think this also goes into the B tier, one of the few non-removal spells that I'll give a B in this set review, at least at common. Mother of Machines, 5 mana, 4, 7, Legendary Frex and Praetor at Mythic with Vigilance, saying if a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent we control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time, and permanents entering the battlefield don't cause abilities of permanents your opponents control to trigger. So we get to double dip, whereas the opponent doesn't get to have any fun. So I think still an A, but definitely not an S tier level card, despite being plastered all over. Next up is the Mirren Bardish. Had to look this one up, how to pronounce it. 5 mana for a common equipment with 4 Mirrodin, giving the equipped creature plus 2 plus 1 and Vigilance. So a 4-3 with Vigilance for 5. A little bit pricey, but we are left with an equipment that gives plus 2 plus 1 and Vigilance, which is quite the upside. And then equips for 3 and a white. So a little bit pricey to play, quite pricey to equip, but it is impactful. So will make for a nice curve topper in a deck that's otherwise relatively low curve. So good in the uh, red-white decks, good in probably the artifact decks, wouldn't mind this. And uh, if you can slap this onto a flying creature, for instance, the damage will quickly add up. So I think this is still probably just a, a C level card, but uh, certainly impactful. Next we've got the Plated Onslaught, 3 and double white for an uncommon instant, with affinity for artifacts, so it gets a 1 mana discount for each artifact we control. So best case scenario, we've got 3 or more artifacts, and we can cast this for just double white, and then the creatures we control get plus 2, plus 1 until end of turn. If we can cast this for just 2 mana, we've got a bunch of maybe mites in play to discount it and to benefit from the plus 2, plus 1. This uh, will certainly inflict a lot of damage, perfect with the 5-mana uh, Basilica Shepherd that we just covered, since that makes 3 creatures with just 1 card. So that's where the Onslaught will shine, and uh, yeah, a lot of the white decks seem to be good at making extra tokens. So I think Onslaught will be quite powerful in the right deck, we'll go with C+. Of course not every deck will necessarily want it, the equipment deck, for instance, probably doesn't need it, even though it might have some artifacts. It tends to go tall with one creature as opposed to go wide, but uh, I think the upside here is still quite high, especially thanks to Affinity. And then we've got the Apostle of Invasion, 6 mana, 4-4 four, four, Frexen Angel at Uncommon with flying, and Corrupted gives it Double Strike. So 4-4 four, four, Double Strike, 
flyer is uh, going to end the game in a couple attacks. A 4-4 four, four flyer for 6 is a bit underwhelming. So you need to put in the work to really make it a powerful threat. Probably C+, plus, still a large flyer, but uh, really want to enable double strike for it. And then at the Eternal, Wanderer, last but not least for sure, 6 mana, 5 loyalty. Says no more than one creature can attack the Eternal Wanderer each combat. So the plus one can flicker our own stuff to maybe re enable an ETB effect. It can take an opposing creature out of commission for a turn cycle since it's not going to come back until the opponent's end step. And then the zero ability makes a 2 2 samurai with double strike. And the minus four, kind of a pseudo sweeper here, making the opponent sacrifice all but one creature that we get to choose. So can maybe let them keep their 1-1 token and then sacrifice the rest. Of course, we also have to sacrifice some stuff, but we also get to choose our best creature in that case. Yeah, the Eternal Wanderer seems pretty messed up and easily gets an S. And then a White Sun's Twilight, I think is our final white card. X and double white for a rare sorcery, saying you gain X life, create X might tokens, and if X is 5 or more, destroy all other creatures. Well, this seems amazing if you can cast it for X is 5 or more. So we're looking at 7 mana for a sweeper that also leaves you with extra 1-1 one -one tokens to maybe end the game and gain a bunch of life, because why not? So Twilight seems quite strong indeed and deserving of a bomb status. And then having the flexibility to maybe still cast it for less than 5, I guess is nice, but ideally we can save up for seven mana. First blue card, Font of Progress. It's a one mana uncommon artifact. It enters battlefield with two oil counters on it, three mana, tap, and then target player mills X cards, where X is the number of oil counters on Font of Progress. So yeah, this card feels a bit out of place with mill not being a supported archetype, but it does come with some oil counters. It's an artifact, can maybe help enable your artifact synergies. If you've got ways to proliferate, you could add more oil counters to the font and then it can maybe turn into a legit win condition, but that's going to take a long time. Feels like there's better win conditions out there. It's also kind of expensive to activate it. So not all that interested in the font. So give this a D. Next up is the Glistener Seer. One mana for an O3 Fraxian Advisor at common. When it enters the battlefield, you get three oil counters on it. Can tap, remove an oil counter to scry one. So early blocker can hold off most one and two drops. And then gives you a bit of card selection with a scry up to three times until maybe you can proliferate. Of course, you do need to have a counter left before you proliferate. So you probably want to leave it at one counter until you find more proliferate effects. But uh, yeah, a lot of relevant card selection. If your deck is quite controlling and you just need an early blocker, this might do. It seems perfect for kind of the blue-black archetype, maybe blue-green also wants it because of the potential with proliferate. So seems playable, give it a C. Next is a minor misstep, one blue mana for an uncommon instant, countering target spell with mana value one or less. Might be cool in formats like Legacy, but as far as limited is concerned, this is just an F. Atmosphere Surgeon, one and a blue for an uncommon. Phyrexian Wizard, 2 1. And whenever we can say non creature spell, put an oil counter on it. Remove an oil counter to give target creature flying until end of turn. Okay, that's a very relevant effect. Just needs a couple counters to uh, set up some lethal attacks. And it's a 2 mana 2 1, which is not exciting, doesn't block mites, which is the main drawback. But. Uh, Seems like a solid addition to most blue decks. Has overlap with oil counters. Good with the uh, blue-red spells archetype as well. So I like Surgeon, C+. Bring the ending. One and a blue for an instant at common, saying a counter target spell unless its controller pays two. So we've seen counter spells like this before. But this one has an interesting twist with Corrupted saying counter that spell instead if it's... I just noticed it's 
has been spelled incorrectly. That's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. Controller has three or more poison counters. Yeah, I mean, Corrupted seems more of a black-white slash green thing than a blue thing. Although, I guess, that being said, blue-green has a bit of poison and proliferate overlap. So that's one way to still get to the three poison counters. If it was just two mana counter unless you pay two, I would say probably like D, maybe C. With the extra effects, it probably bumps it up to at least a C, but probably just keep it at a C and I don't think it quite gets to the C+. Plus. But uh, yeah, it's a uh, two mana counter spell, so you'll have to be aware of it when playing against blue decks with open mana. Next up we have Escaped Experiment, one on a blue for a 2-1 Phyrexian Beast at common. It's also an artifact creature for those artifact synergies. And when it attacks, target creature and opponent controls gets minus X minus O until end of turn, where X is the number of artifacts you control. Interesting, so we can shrink an opposing creature down, but only when the experiment attacks, which is just a 2-1. I mean, even if we shrink something down to zero power, the opponent's likely to have something else back to block and kill this. So I don't feel like the experiment is going to get to attack very often. So this feels pretty weak. Give it a D. Next is the experimental augury. One and a blue for an instant at common. Saying, look at the top three cards of your library, put one of them into your hand, thrust on the bottom, and proliferate. So this could have been playable without Proliferate in some decks, but adding Proliferate makes it pretty exciting. Great for the blue-green Proliferate deck, good for blue-red spells, which can maybe Proliferate some oil counters as well, which are plentiful on uh, some blue and red cards. And this is a common, it's an instant, so you can even leave up your counter spells alongside it. So Augury seems pretty pushed for kind of a common cantrip. I'll go C+. I think a lot of blue decks will be happy to have it. Blue-black also has a lot of synergy with it, potentially. Next is the Icker Synthesizer, one on a blue, for a Phyrexian Wizard at common. It's a 1-3, says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, put an oil counter on it. And as long as it has four or more oil counters, it gets plus two plus zero and cannot be blocked. So that's another situation where casting the uh, previous card to not only satisfy a non-creature spell, but also proliferating, so that's counting for two oil counters, basically. Makes it pretty easy to enable a card like Synthesizer, and then you'll end up with a 3-3 that cannot be blocked. So that's a significant upside. And early on, a 1-3 can still hold off most opposing two drops. So, seems pretty good. I think I'm still probably leaning C for Synthesizer, since it does take a while to get there if you draw it late. It also doesn't uh, necessarily do a whole lot. So yeah, C seems fine, but has a ton of upside. Next we've got Malkator's Watcher, one on a blue for a 1-1 artifact creature Phyrexian drone at common. This drone does actually fly, also has vigilance, and when it dies we get to draw a card. That's pretty neat. Can be perfect for your blue-white artifact deck as kind of an early creature to enable some of those synergies. Yeah, I like C plus for Watcher. I'm sold. Next we've got a Mercurial Spell Dancer, one on a blue for a 2-1 Phyrexian Rogue at a rare. It cannot be blocked, so already a 2-1 that cannot be blocked for 2 mana seems excellent. And then whenever we cast a non-creature spell, we can put an oil counter on it. And when it deals combat damage to an opponent, we may remove two oil counters from it. If we do, when we cast our next instant or sorcery spell, we get to copy that spell and choose new targets. Deciding between a B and an A for Spell Dancer. Of course, you can still top deck it late and then it won't be able to copy anything right away. It takes a while to get going. But uh, yeah, if played on turn two, this can easily win you a game if it goes unanswered. So we'll go with B for Spell Dancer. But. Uh, could easily adjust it to an A if it overperforms. Prologue to Phyraces, one on a blue for an instant at common, saying each opponent gets a poison counter and draw card. Okay, so yeah, if you don't want to mess with toxic creatures, 
this is a way to get the initial poison counter on the opponents, and then you might have other ways to proliferate those poison counters, and it's still a cantrip that draws a card. So this one, I think, gets a C plus as well. If I had to choose between Prologue and the Experimental Augury that we just covered, the one that finds one in the top three and then proliferates, the uh, Experimental Augury seems better, since Proliferate has a bit more synergy with oil counters as well, and of course you get a bit more card selection as opposed to just drawing. But there may be decks that actively want both as their win condition, just to draw a bunch of cards, poison counters first with a prologue, and then afterwards you can proliferate to maybe win the game. So it could be a thing, maybe even in Constructed, who knows. But uh, yeah, C plus for prologue. Next is Serum Snare, one in a blue for an instant at Uncommon, returning target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. If that permanent had mana value 3 or less, we also get to proliferate. So reminiscent of Fading Hope, but this one can hit any opposing non-land permanent, not just creatures. And instead of scrying, we get to proliferate, which, you know, could be better, could be worse, but still a nice upside. So Serum Snare, C+, plus for sure. Next we have Thrumming Bird. This is a reprint. We've seen this one before. One and a blue for a 1-1 Phyrexian Bird Horror at Uncommon with Flying. And when it deals combo damage to a player, we also get to Proliferate. So nice repeatable way to Proliferate potentially. Gonna be quite good in kind of a, the blue-red deck with a lot of oil counters once again. And on a 1-1 Flyer means it's not gonna be too difficult to get this one through. Thrumming Bird gets a C plus as well. We've got Blade of Shared Souls, two in a blue for an artifact equipment at rare with four Mirrodin, so it comes attached to a rebel. And then when it becomes attached to a creature, for as long as Blade remains attached to it, we may have that creature become a copy of another target creature we control. That's interesting, so it's kind of like a clone with extra steps. But for 3 mana, often see clone effects for 4, and this also has the upside of being able to re-equip it for 2 mana later, and then still maybe have a 2-2 two -two rebel left over. So there's a lot going on here. Yeah, thing that bumps it up to a B. A lot of flexibility. Great when you can copy your bomb with it, of course. But uh, yeah, on most boards, I think you're going to be happy with a blade. Next is Chrome Prowler, 2 in a blue for a 3-2 Phyrexian Cat at common. It's an artifact creature as well, with flash, and when it enters we can tap target creature and opponent controls. So, best use case for the Prowler is probably to flash this in right before attackers are declared, tap the opponent's largest creature, and then we've got a 3-2 blocker now, maybe next turn we can set up some attacks now that the opponent's creature is tapped. So, quite useful. The fact that it has flash means it plays well with counter spells and other instant speed plays. So you can maybe flash it in end of turn instead if you want to keep up counter spell mana. So quite versatile. Artifact plays well in the blue-white artifact uh, archetype as well, but I think still just a C at the end of the day. Distorted Curiosity to in a blue for an uncommon sorcery, and we get to draw two cards, so Divination. But if we have Corrupted enabled, it's just going to cost a single blue for a draw two. So yeah, that's potentially an incentive to uh, play the uh, two mana, put a poison counter on an opponent and draw a card, then proliferate and all of a sudden we can draw two cards for one mana instead. So that's uh, what we're hoping to set up. But even Divination, three mana draw two is totally fine. So a C plus for Curiosity. Then Eye of Malkator is 2 and a blue for an artifact at common. When it enters the battlefield, scry 2. And whenever another artifact enters, the eye can become a 4-4 artifact creature until end of turn. Can potentially be enabled at instant speed as well, if you can flash in the uh, cat we just covered, for instance. But for the most part, looking to uh, beat down with a 4-4 by playing some artifacts main phase, so, interesting card. Um, it's not always going to be a creature, but when it is, it hits pretty hard. Gets an immediate effect when it enters, Scry 2, which is nice. 
think still just a C for the I, but I could see this one also overperforming a bit and going closer to a C plus in the dedicated artifact decks. A Gitaxian Raptor to in a blue for a 1 4 Frexian Bird at common, it flies and enters with three oil counters on it. Can remove one oil counter at any point to give it plus one, minus one until end of turn. So a 1 4 flyer plays defense quite well, can pack in for one, but thanks to the oil counters, we can essentially deal three extra damage spread out across however many turns. Maybe we get to proliferate once or twice and activate it even more. So it does hit pretty hard when we want it to. Just gonna make sure the opponent's tapped out before we spend all our oil counters in one place. But uh, yeah, I like the Raptor, C+. Then the Icker Moon Gauntlet, 2 and a blue for a mythic rare artifact. And it has to do with Planeswalkers, which in limited, you know, aren't all that uh, common. Planeswalkers we control can have a zero ability that lets them proliferate, and they have a minus 12 that lets us take an extra turn after this one. Okay, that's fun. And then whenever we cast a non-creature spell, choose a counter on target permanent, put an additional counter of that kind on that permanent. So it's kind of like proliferating, but only for one permanent. And I guess uh, it doesn't work with poison counters. So Gauntlet seems like a fun build around for Constructed, but uh, I'm gonna leave it in the sideboard for most of my limited decks, unless I'm lucky enough to open three or four Planeswalkers, in which case, sure. Uh, of course, still has an effect with the second uh, sentence there, letting us pseudo-proliferate, but I don't think it's necessarily worth a whole card. Next is the Mesmerizing Doze. One and a double blue for an aura at common to enchant an opposing creature and keep it tapped down, and we also get to proliferate. So that's neat. So bit of an upgrade over similar effects we've seen in the past. And uh, yeah, Proliferate can certainly be a relevant upside. Now, these types of removal spells have a few drawbacks. Opponent can sacrifice their creature, they can pick it back up and replay it, they could destroy the enchantment. And this one's also a little bit harder to cast than the white counterparts since it's double blue, so we won't always have double blue available early on. So I think that bumps it down from a B to a C+, plus, but still a card I'm happy to play in pretty much every blue deck. Reject Imperfection is our uncommon counter spell of the set. So one and double blue, counter spell, and then if that spell's mana value was three or less, we also get to proliferate. So these three mana hard counters are better the higher curve the format is basically. It actually ended up being pretty decent in Brother's War just because of all those expensive prototype creatures. This set doesn't strike me like a particularly slow set, like sure, the games may be pretty long and grindy, but the average mana value of cards isn't super high, so that makes it trickier to keep up three mana constantly and then also get rewarded for keeping up that mana since the opponent's spells are probably not going to be much more expensive. So. Overall, Reject Imperfections playable, but not a card I would prioritize, so we'll just give it a C. Next is Tamiyo's Logbook, 2 and a blue for an artifact at Uncommon. It's 5 and a blue, tap, draw a card, but it gets a 1 mana discount for each author artifact we control. So it does not count itself, but counts author artifacts. So at what point are we happy with Logbook? How much mana do we want to spend to draw a card? Well, best case scenario, just a single blue mana, which requires five other artifacts. That's going to take a while. But realistically, like we're going to play some artifact creatures initially, maybe play logbook turn six. If we have three mana for logbook, three mana left. So we would already need to have three other artifacts in play to be able to activate the logbook the same turn we played it. So that's, you know, not impossible, but... Uh, certainly a bit ambitious. So in the dedicated blue-white artifact deck, I think I'm still gonna be pretty happy with the logbook. Outside of it, it seems a little too expensive. So I think we'll go with a C for the logbook. The deck that actually can 
play it should be able to get its hands on it since other decks wouldn't be very interested. Trawler Drake is 2 and a blue for a 0 0 Phyrexian Drake at Uncommon. It flies, enters the battlefield with an oil counter on it, and gets plus 1 plus 1 for each oil counter on it. Otherwise, it would just die right away, which would be a little awkward. And then, whenever we cast a non creature spell, put an oil counter on a Trawler Drake. So, perfect for your blue green proliferate deck, which can maybe cast some non creature spells as well as put more oil counters on it. But even blue red spells will be very happy with it. Maybe not at its best in blue white artifacts, but uh, yeah, blue black as well has lots of proliferate synergies. So goes into most of the blue archetypes, and as a flyer that gets bigger, it can turn into a real threat. So I like a B for Trawler Drake, seems like a pretty high pick. Next we have Unctus, a Grand Meta Attack to 1 and double blue for a 2 4 legendary Fraxin Vidalcan, artifact creature as well. Add rare. And uh, other blue creatures we control let us draw a card and then discard a card whenever they become tapped. Other artifact creatures we control get plus 1 plus 1 for either 2 life or 1 blue mana. Until end of turn, target creature we control becomes a blue artifact in addition to its other colors and types, can only be used at sorcery speed. So Unctus, a lord for artifacts, it's going to be perfect for the blue-white archetype. But the fact that we can turn other creatures into blue artifacts means it can still be quite useful in other decks. 3 mana, 2 fours, not the worst. And uh, can maybe pump up some creatures and give us some card selection. So Unctus seems quite strong, easily gets a B. Then we've got Unctus' Retrofitter, 2 and a blue for a 2-3 Phyrexian Artificer at Uncommon with Toxic 1. And when it enters a battlefield, up to one target artifact we control becomes an artifact creature with base power toughness 4-4 four, four, for as long as the Retrofitter remains on the battlefield. So we've seen effects like this in the past, and yeah, they're usually pretty decent, especially if we can uh, pair this with a cheap artifact. Could also be quite nice with the Might tokens, turning them into a 4-4 that still has Toxic 1 could be helpful. It's a 2-3 by itself, so not the worst stats. So like a C plus for the Retrofitter. Next we have Encroaching Mycosynth 3 in a blue for a rare artifact. And says a non-land permanence you control our artifacts in addition to their other types. And the same is true for permanent spells we control. So cards that are on the stack, I guess, and non-land permanent cards we own that aren't on the battlefield. So cards in our hands, cards in our library. Okay, so everything's an artifact. I guess that's cool if you need to increase your artifact count for some synergies. Are we willing to pay 4 mana and spend a whole turn basically casting this? I don't think so. I could see some borderline cases where your deck is filled with Tamiyo's logbooks, and uh, we've got some of the, the blue-white uncommon that grows with a number of artifacts. Like, those cards could improve, but I think it's just such a rare circumstance for it to be worth it. So I'm just going to give it an F to discourage people from running it. Next we have the Gitaxian Anatomist, 3 and a blue for a 2-5 Fraxian Wizard at common. When it enters the battlefield, you may tap it if you do proliferate. Yeah, fine card, nothing special, give it a C. And then we've got the Jace, the Perfected Mind. Jace has been completed, which makes a Mythic Rare. Can be played for 2 and a blue, and 2 life, in which case it's 3 loyalty, or 4 mana, in which case we get all 5 loyalty. The plus 1 can keep an opposing creature in check, giving it minus 3 minus 0 until end of turn or until our next turn, so persists throughout the opponent's turn as well. The minus two says target player mills three cards, then if a graveyard has 20 or more cards in it, we draw three, otherwise we draw one card. And then the minus x says target player mills three times x cards. Can at most mill 15 the turn we play it. Could still be pretty decent and limited, although, you know, 40 cards average, let's say by the time we cast Jace, the opponent has like 28-ish cards left in their deck, then milling 13 is still only half their library. 
So Jace by himself probably doesn't really get there unless you can protect him and just use the plus one and minus two a bunch. But that feels pretty difficult to set up. So I don't think milling someone in limited with Jace is going to be all that realistic unless you can pair it with a one mana artifact we started our uh, blue cards with. But playing a bunch of bad cards to maybe mill the opponent doesn't seem like the best plan. So we're mainly evaluating Jace based on the plus one and minus two. So it can shrink opposing creatures down and then draw a card for a few turns until we maybe get to draw three. But it's a minus two ability, so it's not like we can use it over and over again. So I'm not overly impressed by Jace. I think I'll still play it in most of my blue decks. It plays well with Proliferate, adding extra loyalty. So that's maybe a way to play Jace at five loyalty and one or two extra counters before using the minus. And then if we can do like a minus seven, then we can maybe one hit KO the opponent. So that's what we're trying to set up. But uh, otherwise, mainly looking to proliferate to draw more cards with a minus two. So yeah, we'll give Jace a B. Seems playable, but I don't think it's quite a bomb. Then we've got a Meld Web Curator, three and a blue for a 3-4 Phyrexian Wizard at common. When it enters the battlefield, put up to one target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard on top of your library. So gets maybe a removal spell back. It's a four mana, three, four. Yeah, fine playable, nothing exciting, gets a C. Then we've got the Mind Splice Apparatus. Three and a blue for a rare artifact with flash, saying at the beginning of your upkeep, put an oil counter on it and instant and sorcery spells we cast to get a one mana discount for each oil counter on the apparatus. We've seen a couple instants and sorceries that would benefit from a discount. They mostly cost two mana, so one mana discount is already enough. But of course there are a few more expensive ones out there too. So Apparatus wants to be played in probably like a blue-red spells deck with a high density of instants and sorceries to eventually give you a big enough discount. It's going to require a very specific deck and uh, then the problem is what if you build your deck around Apparatus and you don't draw Apparatus then you're left with a bunch of expensive instants and sorceries then maybe don't do enough by themselves. So it seems like a bit of a dangerous card to uh, build your deck around. So I think I'm gonna go with D for Apparatus, but uh, could be a lot of fun if you can actually make it work and build a deck around it successfully. Tamiyo's Immobilizer is three and a blue for an uncommon artifact. It enters with four oil counters on it, and we can tap, remove an oil counter from it, and then tap target artifact or creature. So repeatable tap effects, although it will eventually run out of oil counters, unless we can keep proliferating more counters onto it. The effect is pretty powerful. We've definitely seen cards like this in the past. They usually cost a bit of mana to activate. This one is free and then can be used in the opponent's end step, maybe again in our turn to tap two creatures down total and set up some good attacks. So it is powerful, but I would only really want it in a deck that can consistently keep proliferating to uh, keep the oil counters going. So, end of the day, I think C plus for Immobilizer. Then we've got the legendary Phyrexian in blue, four mana for Tacothal Inquiry Dominus, which is a three five flyer, saying if we would proliferate, proliferate twice instead. So there's your payoff for the proliferated decks. You can also pay the same Phyrexian mana and then remove three counters from among other artifacts, creatures, and planeswalkers we control to put an indestructible counter on Tankothal. So removing three counters, a bit more of a challenge than some of the other legendaries we've seen so far, and we'll see later. But not impossible if you've got a few creatures with oil counters, and then uh, especially if we get to proliferate, then the indestructible is within reach, and then a 3-5 flyer is also pretty exciting since it actually seems to have better stats than the white legendary we've seen so far, which was just a 4-4. So a 3-5 flyer seems like an upgrade there and uh, can just beat down by himself. So yeah, this seems like a bomb for sure. Gets an A. 
Then we've got the Transplant Theorist, 3 and a blue for a 2-4 uncommon Fraxin Artificer. When the Theorist or another artifact enters a battlefield under your control, you may draw a card if you do discard a card. And for 2 mana, can put target card from your graveyard on the bottom of your library. So the last bit of text hopefully is not going to end up being too relevant, but uh, getting to draw and discard is pretty nice. And there's quite a few other artifacts in the set to keep enabling it. So yeah, and the dedicated artifact deck, I'm pretty happy with Theorist. So we'll go with C+. Then the Melt Web Strider is 4 and a blue for a 5-5 vehicle at common with Vigilance. Okay, that's nice. And it also enters with an oil counter on it, and we can remove an oil counter to turn it into a creature until end of turn. And as a vehicle, would of course become a 5-5 creature with Vigilance. Can even activate this at instant speed in the opponent's turn, so it can help play defense the turn we played if needed. And then otherwise we can crew it with a crew cost of 3. So a little bit pricey to crew. Crew 3 is not the easiest, especially in blue where creatures tend to be a bit smaller. But the fact that we get at least one free activation and then can maybe proliferate to keep activating it is nice. So I think this card's playable and uh, has quite a few synergies in both the proliferate decks as well as the artifact decks. So we'll go with C for Strider. Then we've got the Quicksilver Fisher, 3 and double blue for a 4-3 Franks and Drake at common with flying. And when it enters, we get to draw a card and then discard a card. Totally fine card. Although it doesn't seem to have any particular synergy in any of the archetypes, just a fine common that can slot into any blue deck. And uh, I think it does so successfully, and we'll get a C+, pretty large flyer. And then we've got the Vivi Surgeon's Insight, 3 and double blue for a sorcery, add common to draw 3 cards and proliferate. Okay, yeah, sign me up. Seems like a nice way to spend 5 mana refuel our hand and maybe enable some synergies with proliferate as well so playable but you know it's expensive so there's only so many of these you can put into a deck before you get in trouble so go with c plus for insight and then the watchful blister zoa is a six mana four four frexin jellyfish at uncommon it flies enters with one oil counter and when it dies, we get to draw cards equal to the number of oil counters on it. So hopefully we get to proliferate a few times, and then we get to draw more than one card. But yeah, I like the Blister Zoa quite a bit. 4-4 four, four Flyer often requires an answer, and if the opponent does deal with it, we'll often get to draw a card in the process, maybe even more. So I'll go with a B for Blister Zoa. And then last but not least, Blue Sun's Twilight Accent Double Blue for our rare Twilight. It's a sorcery, gaining control of target creature with mana value X or less. If X is 5 or more, we also get to create a token that's a copy of that creature. Can steal tokens for X equals 0, which is kind of nice. But best case scenario, we can cast it for 7 mana and then not only steal something very large, but also make a copy of it. Definitely a bomb level card, which will give an A. So that wraps up blue. First black card is Annihilating Glare, 1 mana for a sorcery at common, saying as an additional cost to cast it, pay 4 mana or sacrifice an artifact or creature, and then destroy target creature or planeswalker. We've seen a lot of these effects in the past, and they're usually pretty good at their best in the more dedicated sacrifice decks, which in this case is red-black, um, but even outside of it, sometimes you're in a pinch and you just need to cast it by sacking a creature. Sometimes you've got creatures you don't mind sacrificing, and you can always cast it for 5 mana, which is not efficient, but if it deals with the opponent's bomb, then it was definitely worth it. So I like C plus for Glare. Next is the Bilious Skull Dweller, 1 mana for a 1-1 one -one Phyrexian Insect at Uncommon, has Death Touch and Toxic 1. So a good pairing, since Death Touch makes it kind of tricky for the opponent to block without trading something valuable and plays defense well and then toxic can slowly poison the opponent maybe enable your corrupted synergies this will be perfect in kind of the black green poison decks but still very good in black white as well i imagine 
So we'll give the skull dweller a C plus. Next we have Duress, another reprint, and it's good to have this for standard sideboards. And limited, I typically don't like Duress too much, seems a bit too narrow. Most decks consist of a lot of creatures and only a few non-creature spells, so Duress gets a D. Next is the Vat of Rebirth, one mana for an uncommon artifact. Says whenever another artifact or creature we control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put an oil counter on the vat, and then two and a black tap it, remove four oil counters from the vat to return a target creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield. Okay, so takes quite a while to get to four counters. If we do, it's not like we have to sacrifice the vat, it will stay in play to maybe go off a second time, but realistically are we gonna get eight oil counters on the vat? I doubt it. So it's eventually four mana and a lot of time and effort to get back a creature from the graveyard. Feels like it's not really worth the investments, so I'm gonna go with a D for vat. Whisper of the Dross is a one mana instant at common saying target creature gets minus one, minus one until end of turn, and we also get to proliferate. Now if the set had a lot of like plus one counters or minus one counters to synergize with uh, proliferate, I would be more into the Whisper of the Dross. The fact that it's mostly oil counters and poison counters we're proliferating makes this less of a blowout if you can cast it at instant speed for one mana. So it just feels kind of like a, a weak removal effect, even if proliferate can be nice. Go with a D for Whisper, just doesn't seem quite impactful enough. Next we have Anoint with Affliction, one in a black for an instant at common. Exile's target creature if it has mana value 3 or less. Okay, that's pretty good. And if we have Corrupted enabled, we get to just exile any creature and there's no longer a restriction. Even without a restriction, this card's still very playable. But uh, being able to exile any creature for 2 mana is awesome although it does take a bit of work to get there, but still seems like one of the better common removal spells in black, so we'll go with B for Anoint with Affliction. Then the Blight Belly Rat is one on the black for a 2-2 Frexen Rat at common, Toxic 1, and when it dies we proliferate. Totally fine common, gets a C. Drown and Icker is another great removal spell, one on the black for an uncommon sorcery, giving minus 4 minus 4, and we get to proliferate. So easily another B can even take care of opposing indestructible creatures, like we've seen with those Phyrexian mythic rares. So this can still take them out, even if they have an indestructible counter, which is pretty nice. Fleshless Gladiator, one on a black, for a 2-2 at common. Phyrexian Skeleton, pretty funny flavor text. And for 2 on a black, we can return the Gladiator from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped, but we also lose one life and can only use it, of course, if the opponent has three or more poison counters. So a two-drop that can maybe keep coming back from the graveyard, although it will still cost us a bit of life. Could be kind of a repeatable sacrifice fodder in the red-black sacrifice decks, although the problem there is that red-black doesn't have a heavy focus on inflicting poison. But at the end of the day, it's still a two-drop with a late-game utility, so can go too wrong with it. We'll give it a C. And then the Necrogen Communion is one on the black for an uncommon enchantment aura. Enchants one of our own creatures, giving it toxic 2. And when the enchanted creature dies, return that card to the battlefield under your control. Now the problem with enchantments like this is that there's still other ways of answering creatures besides destroying them. Your creature could get bound, it could get tapped, it could get exiled. So that's a problem with the communion even if you do manage to put it on your bomb to quote unquote protect it. So yeah, I'm not a fan. Toxic 2 could be nice if you can put this on a flying creature in a dedicated toxic deck, but it feels like there's still better cards to accomplish a similar job, so I'll give it a D. Offer Immortality is a comma trick and it's similar to one we've seen before. One on a black for an instant to give death touch and indestructible until end of turn. So a decent trick, both defensively and offensively, and uh, 
yeah, common tricks usually get a C, so this one gets a C as well. Then we've got the Pestilent Siphoner, one on a black for a 1-1 one, one insect. At common, it flies and it has Toxic 1. So this is the perfect way to enable your Corrupted Synergies. We've got a small flyer with Toxic to inflict those poison counters. And then if the opponent eventually removes it or presents a larger creature that can block it, hopefully at least we got our three poison counters in and then we don't care anymore. So C plus for the Siphoner seems like an important enabler for the Corrupted decks. And next up we've got the Scheming Aspirant, one in a black for a 1-3 Phyrexian Advisor at Uncommon. It says whenever we proliferate, each opponent loses two life and we gain two life. Creature we can play early to play a bit of defense. And then ideally we're kind of in the blue-black proliferate deck. And we can slowly drain the opponent while gaining a life, importantly too. So seems pretty strong for a two-drop. It does require a pretty specific deck to shine. So it's not going to be great in any black deck, but uh, in blue-black specifically, easily a C+. Then we've got Shieldred's Edict, one in a black for an instant at Uncommon, letting us choose one between making the opponent sacrifice a non-token creature, making them sacrifice a creature token, or sacrifice a Planeswalker. And of course, while Planeswalkers are mostly rare and mythic, it's still nice to have a clean solution to them. This can even take care of an opposing Kaya, which has Hexproof, because the opponent has to sacrifice and not have their creature or Planeswalker targeted. So that's potentially a nice answer to it. And uh, yeah, the fact that it makes a distinction between tokens and non-tokens means that if the opponent has, let's say, one great creature and a Might, then we can still hit a better creature at least. But Edicts still have that uh, awkwardness in Limited especially, if the opponent's just curving out with 2-drop, 3-drop, and then maybe plays a bomb, then they can simply sacrifice their weaker creature and keep the bomb in play. So, I think Edict's playable, but it's not exciting. Definitely a lot worse than some of the previous targeted removal spells, despite potentially offering an answer to Planeswalkers. But then you can always sideboard this in if you're playing best of three, and your opponent's lucky enough to have a Planeswalker in their deck. Next is Vran, Executioner, Thane, one on a black for a 2-2, Fraxen Vampire, at rare, it's legendary, and whenever one or more author creatures you control die, each opponent loses two life and you gain two life, but it only triggers once each turn. So Vran itself doesn't really want to get its hands too dirty, just wants to kind of sit there, let other creatures around it die, and then hopefully drain the opponent for a bunch. I wish this had better defensive stats, so it could at least block a little bit better, since you're probably not going to be attacking with it a whole lot. So, could be a decent way to get some extra damage in your red-black sacrifice decks, especially. So we'll go with C+, plus for Vran, still definitely a 2-drop I would be happy to play, since it can attack and block where needed early, and then hopefully stick around and be a good way to get some extra damage in. Then we've got the Ambulatory Edifice, 2 and a black for a 3-2 artifact creature Phyrexian Construct at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, we may pay 2 life. When we do, target creature gets minus 1, minus 1 until end of turn. So, easy way to take care of maybe a Might token. We've seen a few flying creatures that have one toughness, so that's a nice answer to those. And it's still a 3-2. can also play it maybe second main after attacking opponent maybe blocked with a larger creature that we can now finish off. So this is quite flexible. It's also an artifact for any artifact synergies, even though they're less important in black. So C plus for Edifice still seems quite good. Then we've got the Bone Picker Scourge, two and a black for a 2-2 Phyrexian Imp at common. It flies, and with Corrupted enabled, it has both Death Touch and Lifelink. So if we can get a 2-2 Death Touch lifelink with flying, it's great. 2-2 flying for 3, not as good as it used to be. But uh, yeah, assuming you're in a corrupted deck, so black-white probably the best home for it. This seems decent, so I'll go with a C+. Chittering Skitterling is 2 and a black for a 1-4 Phyrexian Rat at Uncommon. And with corrupted enabled, we can sacrifice an artifact or creature to draw a card but can only 
activate this of course with corrupted so three or more poison counters required interesting sacrifice outlet again sacrifice synergies would be at their best in red black but can we actually get those three poison counters when red has almost no ways of uh, getting them in the first place the card itself seems strong but it's probably going to be at its best in black white where corrupted is more of a thing and then maybe pair this with a one drop that leaves behind a mite when it dies and you've got yourself a nice card draw engine so the upside here is incredibly high but if you don't have corrupted enabled it's pretty underwhelming next up we've got the cutthroat centurion two and a black for a two two fraction warrior at common and we can sacrifice another artifact or creature to give it plus two plus two until end of turn but can only be activated once each turn still threatens to turn into a 4-4 and the threat of activation is what's important opponent has a 3-3 back on defense we attack for two opponent probably takes it if we have some cheap creature we don't mind sacrificing and uh yeah this one actually does fit nicely into the red black archetype where you maybe have some 1-1 one -one tokens you don't mind sacrificing and then at some point you can actually get the extra damage in if needed so totally fine card at its best in red black then we've got geth thane of contracts one and double black for a three four legendary phyrexian zombie at rare giving other creatures you control minus one minus one who a drawback don't see those very often these days and then for one and double black we can tap and return target creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield and if this creature would leave the battlefield exile it instead of putting it anywhere else okay so we've got repeatable reanimation but we do have to shrink our own team down in order to keep Geth around. Now it's still a 3-4 by itself, does not get minus one, minus one. So that's nice. And uh, yeah, hopefully we've got some nice creatures to reanimate. This will be also pretty good, I believe, in kind of a red-black deck. Although if you're making 1-1 one -one tokens, they would instantly die, which is probably not the desired effect. So a card with a lot of potential, but it could also spell your own demise in a way. So I'll go with a C plus for Geth. The upside is there, but you need to be sure that it's actually going to be worth it. Infectious Inquiry, two and a black for a sorcery at common to draw two cards at the cost of two life, and each opponent also gets a poison counter. So this seems quite good in like a black-white corrupted deck to get those initial counters. Outside of it, 3 mana for 2 life and 2 cards is pretty steep since we don't get any additional card selection. But uh, yeah, I think playable, especially in black-white, otherwise just a C. Then we've got Karumonix, the Rat King, 1 and double black for a 3-3 three, three legendary Frexin Rat. Yeah, it's a pretty nice commander potentially. Has Toxic 1 and says other rats you control have Toxic 1. And when it enters the battlefield, to look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal any number of rat cards from among them and put them into your hand, the rest on the bottom in a random order. Now, there's not very many rats in this set, unfortunately. We've seen the Skitterling, that's one of them, and then I think there's a second one as well. But don't count on a lot of rats being revealed by the Rat King. So we're mostly looking at a 3-3 Toxic 1 and that's it, playable stats, so we'll give it a C. Then we've got Fraxian Arena, reprinted, and finally in standard again, one and double black for a rare enchantment, saying at the beginning of our upkeep, we draw a card and we lose one life. So this card can be incredibly powerful when played early, especially if uh, you're not facing a hyper-aggressive deck. Most games in limiteds, you could describe as two mid-range decks going at it and uh, this is an amazing source of card advantage ideally you've got a bit of life gain in your deck to make up for the lost life if your deck is more aggressively slanted then the life loss is also less of a concern because you're the one beating down so the opponent's the one that has to be afraid of their life total going down but in general, I think if you're playing a, a black deck capable of casting it, you should probably play it. And uh, yeah, we'll give it a B. Very powerful, but there are some risks involved since losing a life is not optional. 
Then we've got uh, Stinging Hive Master to win a black for a 3 2 Fraxen Warlock at common with Toxic 1. And when it dies, it makes a 1 1 Might. So good sacrifice fodder for your red black sacrifice deck as it leaves behind an extra body. And a 3 2 with Toxic 1, you know, is fine. Nothing exciting, but playable. Give it a C. Vraska's Fall to win a black for an instant at common. And this is an Edict, making the opponent sacrifice a creature or Planeswalker. And they also get a Poison Counter. So once again, probably at its best in Black-White to enable those Corrupted Synergies. Otherwise, I'm not very excited to play a 3-mana Edict in Limited, like we discussed earlier. So I'll give this a C. Archfiend of the Dross to end double black for a Frexian Demon at rare. A 6-6 Flyer. That enters with four oil counters on it, and at the beginning of our upkeep we have to remove an oil counter from it, and then if there's no left, we lose the game. Wow. And then whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, its controller also loses two life. So better win in a timely fashion, but a 6-6 flyer can certainly help with that. The disaster scenario is where the opponent can enchant it, and then uh, basically keep it around without you actually being able to attack with it. So that could be bad, but hopefully you have a contingency plan being able to sacrifice it to another effect, or maybe you can uh, proliferate to add more oil counters to it to keep it around for a bit longer. But uh, yeah, most black decks either have sacrifice effects or can proliferate a bit, so it should still be quite good. And if the opponent doesn't have removal, they're just going to die to it. So that's neat. So I don't think you should be too scared of the drawback. Definitely a bomb. So we'll give it an A. Feed the Infection. Three and a black for an uncommon sorcery. Let's us draw three cards and lose three life. So pretty steep cost. But we also have Corrupted. Each opponent who has three or more poison counters loses three life as well. So we can share the pain, but uh, yeah, do we want 4 mana draw 3, lose 3 in most decks? There's definitely better card draw in blue, if you're in blue-black, so maybe in uh, black-white with Corrupted Synergies, this could make the cut. I think I still prefer the uh, 3 mana draw 2, lose 2, which at least can enable other Corrupted Synergies. So this being the uncommon, I think I'm less interested in it than the common counterpart, but uh, still playable, we'll give it a C. A Necrosquito, 3 and a black for a 0, zero Fraxian Insect at Uncommon. It flies and enters with two oil counters on it, and gets plus one plus one for each oil counter. Whenever another creature or artifact we control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, we can add an extra oil counter to the Necrosquito. So it will grow over time, but it does start out as a pretty small flyer. So it takes a bit of work. Um, the payoff is potentially there, but uh, I think the blue flyer is quite a bit better than uh, Necrosquito, so we'll give this a C+. And then Phyrexian Obliterator is back. Quadruple black, 5-5 five, five trample at Mythic, and whenever a source deals damage to the Obliterator, that source's controller sacrifices that many permanents. The yeah, Obliterator does not mess around. You better have a clean answer at the ready, otherwise this could kind of play as a 5-5 five, five unblockable since you're never going to be able to block it profitably. Best case scenario you've got like a small death touch creature that can trade for it, so that's maybe still a way out, but it's still going to cost you quite a few permanents. And uh, if the opponent decides to play defense and you don't have any evasive attackers, it's also going to be almost impossible to attack into it unless you can kill the opponent on the spot. So very powerful card, but quadruple blank is the main hurdle. So if you open this, then you kind of force yourself to go mono black, and you might pass up on some great cards if other colors are open. So maybe you actually prefer to open this in pack two after you've already committed to black, so you don't feel as bad. So yeah, powerful card for sure, easily bomb status, but uh, there are certainly answers out there that. Uh, can answer it cleanly, so not quite an S. A Ravenous and Necro Titan 2 and double black for a 6 6 Fraxian Horror at Uncommon. If we have 
corrupted, then it's just 4 mana 6 6. If we don't have corrupted enabled, we have to sacrifice a creature when it enters the battlefield. Now, sacrificing a creature, not always a big deal if you're, let's say, playing a deck with some might tokens that you don't mind getting rid of in the red black sacrifice deck, this could be okay. So, having to sacrifice a creature doesn't have to be a huge drawback. So, I think the Necro Titan's pretty good actually, and uh, we'll give it a B. But of course, in the more dedicated, corrupted enabling decks, you just get a 4 mana 6 6, which is great. Then we've got Shieldred's Hat Cleaver, 3 and a black for a 2 4 Phyrexian Warrior at common with Menace and Toxic 2. Those two abilities go hand in hand. Menace makes it hard to block, and then if you do get to hit the opponent, Toxic 2 for two poison counters is pretty nice. Now, not impossible for the opponent to double block it, but it's probably gonna at least trade for one creature. So this seems like a totally fine common. Good in the black-green poison decks, but black-white also probably happy to enable corrupted synergies. Testament Bearer, 3 and a black for a 4-1 Phyrexian Warrior at common. And when it dies, look at the top three cards of your library, put one of them into your hand, and the rest into your graveyard. Okay, so 4-1 makes it kind of an awkward blocker when it comes to might tokens and smaller toxic creatures. But 4 power means it does trade up for larger things potentially too. So that's nice. And it does provide card advantage when it dies. So kind of like the, the bear, we'll give it a C+. Next is Drivnod, Carnage, Dominus, 3 and double black for an 8-3 Legendary Phyrexian Horror at Mythic. Says if a creature dying causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. And we've seen a few death triggers so far. The last card, a great example. And we can also pay 2 Phyrexian mana and exile 3 creature cards from your graveyard to put an indestructible counter on Drivnod. So this is one of the easier requirements to accomplish, I think. Just exile three cards from graveyards, don't have to sacrifice any permanents or do anything too fancy. And then we get an 8-3 that's indestructible, potentially. That seems great. So, yeah, Drifnod, definitely a bomb. We'll give it an A. Gulping Scrap Tramp is 4 and a black for a 4-4 Phyrexian Horror at common. When it enters the battlefield or dies, we get to proliferate. Okay, totally fine uh, playable. Not incredibly large for 5 mana, but provides a good bit of value. And hopefully you've got more synergy with proliferate. So we'll give it a C. Nimraiser Paladin, 4 and a black for a 4-4 four, four, Phyrexian Knight at Uncommon with Toxic 2. And when it enters the battlefield, we can return a creature card with mana value 3 or less from our graveyard to our hand. Okay, so this is card advantage, a nice 2 for 1, and 4 for 4 with Toxic 2 is uh, a decent stat line, since we're hopefully getting something back from the graveyard as well. So Paladin will go with a B. Seems like a, a nice 2 for 1 uncommon. Vat Emergence is 4 and a black for an uncommon sorcery. Returning a creature from any graveyard onto the battlefield under our control, and we also get to proliferate. So, we're pretty used to seeing these 5 mana reanimation effects. This one has the extra twist of proliferating, which, you know, is a nice upside. But typically, I've been disappointed with these 5 mana reanimation effects. There's not that many exciting creatures in your deck to begin with that are necessarily worth 5 mana and a card to get back. And let's say you do have one or two bombs that you want to get back, then it's still going to require those creatures to end up in the graveyard, not get exiled, not be enchanted or anything. So it's just a lot of hoops to jump through to maybe get something nice back. It's just a bit too much effort. We'll go with D for Vat Emergence. Cruel Grimnark is 5 and a black for a 5-5 five five Phyrexian Cleric at common has Death Touch, and when it enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card. For each opponent who cannot, we gain 4 life. Okay, as far as common curve toppers go, this is not bad. 5-5 five, five Death Touch will hold off any opposing ground attackers, at least, and provides a decent ETB effect. So, 
C for Cruel Grimnark, totally fine. And then Vraska, Betrayal's Sting, is our Mythic Rare completed Planeswalker in black. So it can be played for 6 mana or 5 mana and 2 life, in which case it's 4 loyalty as opposed to 6. The 0 ability lets us draw a card at the cost of 1 life and we get to proliferate. So kind of like a plus 1 ability since we get to add extra loyalty to all our Planeswalkers by proliferating. Then the minus 2 will turn an opposing creature into a treasure. You can also use it on your own creatures, I guess, if you really need one extra mana. And then the minus nine will give the opponent nine poison counters total, basically. So if you can proliferate afterwards, you win the game. So Fraska seems great. Card draw engine that can remove opposing creatures, even if it does give the opponent a treasure. That's still probably fine in most circumstances. Yeah, I think Vraska gets an S. Repeatable removal, card advantage, eventual win condition. Seems like a very hard card to beat. And then our last black card is Black Sun's Twilight. X and black for an instant at rare. Up to one target creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn. If X is 5 or more, we also get to reanimate a creature with mana value X or less from our own graveyard, although it does enter the battlefield tapped, so it's not like we get to ambush uh, an opposing attacker by bringing a creature back at instant speed, which would be a little bit too good. But uh, yeah, still a nice scalable removal spell, which will hopefully reanimate something. Not the most powerful uh, Twilight card, in my opinion, but easily deserving of a B. Definitely has potential to be a nice two for one. First red card is the Cacophony Scamp. One mana for a 1-1. One, one. When it deals comma damage to a player, we may sacrifice it if we do proliferate. And when it dies, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. And it's an uncommon Phyrexian Goblin Warrior. Okay, so reminiscent of the Fireblade Charger. And uh, yeah, it has a lot of similarities with the Charger which ended up being pretty good. This one also probably wants to go in the equipment decks where we can increase its power, so then when it dies it deals even more damage. So definitely a pretty good one drop. Gets a C+. Churning Reservoir is one mana for an uncommon artifact. At the beginning of your upkeep, put an oil counter on another target non-token artifact or creature you control. Okay. And then we can pay 2 mana, tap it, to create a 1-1 one, one Fraxin Goblin creature token. But we can only activate if an oil counter was removed from a permanent we controlled this turn, or a permanent with an oil counter on it was put into a graveyard this turn. So this is one of the weirdest cards in the set, but I think it's actually pretty good. So putting oil counters on other artifacts or creatures can help enable those particular... Uh, cards with their oil counter abilities. It's only one mana investment, so yeah, in the red green oil counter decks, in uh, blue reds spells, this could be still pretty good since a lot of cards have payoffs for having oil counters. And then occasionally you'll get to make a 1 1 token with it too. So I think Reservoir is actually pretty decent and I'm hopeful and uh, give it a C. Then there's the Exuberant Fusling. One mana for an O1, Phyrexian Goblin Warrior at Uncommon. It tramples and gets one extra power for each oil counter on it. And when it enters the battlefield, and whenever another creature or artifact we control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, we can put an oil counter on the Fuseling. So it will start out as a 1 1 trampler and slowly grow over time, but it will always have one toughness. Not super into the Fuseling, probably okay in the red black sacrifice decks. But even there, it's not an incredible payoff, so I'll just give it a C. Free from Flesh is a 1 mana instant at common, giving a creature plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn, and put 2 oil counters on it. So red's probably the color with most oil counter synergies, so could definitely uh, be quite useful. Only 1 mana, so it's a very cheap combo trick but you probably don't want it outside of the more dedicated oil counter synergy decks, I don't think. Even like a red-white equipment deck, which may want a comma trick, doesn't necessarily have a ton of oil counter synergies. 
one mana plus two plus two is okay. Definitely more efficient than some of the two mana comma tricks out there. So it's playable, but I wouldn't go out of my way to take it early. So just to see. Then there's the Gleeful Demolition. One mana for an uncommon sorcery, destroying an artifact. If we controlled that artifact, create three 1-1 one, one goblin creature tokens. So one mana artifact removal could actually be playable in this set, since there's a fair share of artifacts out there, including artifact creatures. And then occasionally, I guess you could blow up your own artifact, maybe a mite turns into three goblin tokens, who knows. It can help you go wide. So, has a bit of versatility, but we're mostly playing this as a one mana shatter effect at sorcery speed. So, yeah, we'll give it a C. Then the Hex Gold Slash is a one mana instant at common, dealing two damage to a creature. If that creature has toxic, it deals four damage instead. Pretty good efficient burn spell in red. I don't think it quite gets to the B range since it doesn't deal with some of the bombs out there that don't have toxic. But uh, as far as one mana removal spells go, this one's very good. Gets a C. Then there's the Sawblade Scamp, 1 mana, 1-1 one, one Phyrexian Beast at common, has haste, can attack right away on turn 1, and whenever we cast a non-creature spell we can put an oil counter on it, and then it taps, removes an oil counter to deal 1 damage to each opponent, can attack early on, and then once the opponent presents a couple blockers, it can sit back and hopefully you've got kind of a blue-red spells deck, or a red-green deck that cares about oil counters that can still maybe get a counter or two on the scamp, and then it can still deal a few extra points of damage. So it's not impressive, but it is a one drop, so for one mana we do get quite a bit, and uh, as we'll see later there's no shortage of oil counter synergies that the scamp could help enable, thinking of the red-green uncommon that we covered earlier. That one also gets a discount if we control creatures with oil counters, so the scamp could help there as well but still probably at its best in blue-red. So overall, Scamp is a C. Not super high impact, but uh, does a lot for one mana. Next is the Vindictive Flamestoker, one mana, one two, Phyrexian Wizard at rare. Says whenever we cast a non-creature spell, put an oil counter on the Flamestoker. And for seven mana, we can sacrifice it, discard our hand to draw four cards, but it does get a one mana discount for each oil counter on it. So realistically, maybe get like three counters on the Flamestoker, and then instead of seven mana, it's four mana to sacrifice it and get a fresh set of uh, four cards, hopefully once we're empty-handed. So yeah, not bad. Can play it early, kind of forget about it, can maybe still block some 1-1 tokens, and then uh, late game, drawing four cards is quite powerful. So C plus for Flamestoker. The Axiom Engraver is a 2-mana 1-3 Phyrexian Wizard at common, and enters with two oil counters on it, can tap, remove an oil counter to discard and then draw. Gives us a bit of card selection, fine to drop, nothing fancy, gets a C. Then the Barbed Batter Fist is 2-mana for an equipment with the 4 Mirrodin mechanic, so it comes attached to a 2-2 Rebel, giving it plus 1, minus 1. So it's actually a 3-1, can be moved for one mana, although we have to be careful not to move it to a one toughness creature unless we want it to die right away. But yeah, two mana, three one, and then we could be left with a two two if we want to put the equipment elsewhere. And could be nice to maybe get some extra damage in, especially on an evasive creature that has more than one toughness. So it's not actually too bad. Still probably just a C, but uh, the equipment decks will be pretty happy to have it. Blazing Crescendo, one and a red for an instant at common, giving plus three plus one until end of turn. So looks like your typical comma trick, but there's more. We also get to exile the top card of our library. Until the end of our next turn, we may play that card. So assuming you have enough mana to cast whatever you exile, this could be a nice two for one if the opponent doesn't play around it, or it could be plus three damage and then still kind of replaces itself. So I'm actually pretty impressed by the crescendo. Now it's possible that plus three plus one doesn't end up trading favorably all that often, and the opponent may still end up uh, taking your creature out. 
But uh, yeah, I mean, this definitely has the potential to be a two for one. So I don't think I can give it the typical C grade and I'm going to have to go up to a C plus. Doesn't really ask much of you, unlike the other comma trick that potentially draws. This one doesn't really have any special requirements. So any red deck can play it. Hex Gold Halberd is one in a red for an uncommon equipment with four Mirrodin. And the equipped creature, as long as it's our turn, has both First Strike and Trample. So two mana for a 2-2 that's in our turn has First Strike and Trample. And then we can move it for two in a red. Now it doesn't give any additional power and toughness. But yeah, First Strike and Trample are still relevant keywords. And... It's, at the end of the day, a 2-drop with a lot of extra potential upside. So C plus for Halberd. Then we've got Nahiri's Sacrifice, 1 and a red for an uncommon sorcery. It says, as an additional cost to cast it, sacrifice an artifact or creature with mana value X, and then sacrifice deals X damage divided as we choose among any number of target creatures. Again, best case scenario, opponent played their enchantments, to lock down your creature, and now you can sacrifice it and still get some damage out of it. Could be nice in the red-black steal and sacrifice deck if you've got six mana total to set it up. Could also sacrifice, let's say, one of these uh, four Mirrodin equipment that don't necessarily contribute a whole lot, and then still have your 2-2 token left over. So it shouldn't be too difficult to find something you're willing to sacrifice. And then it's a pretty versatile removal spell that can maybe even take out multiple opposing creatures that have one or two toughness. So the upside is there, but it does require a bit of setup. So it's not a card you're going to slam dunk in every red deck, but uh, I think a C is appropriate. Shrapnel Slinger, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two for XM Beast at common. Enters a battlefield and you may sacrifice a creature. When you do, destroy target artifact and opponent controls. So it can even sacrifice itself. So it can turn into just two mana destroying artifact. But you have the flexibility of maybe sacrificing something else. And uh, still take out an opposing artifact. So in the early game, it's just a 2-2. In the late game, it's maybe more of a removal effect. And as we've said, I think destroying artifacts is going to be quite relevant in this set. So... Slinger seems totally fine. Give it a C grade. Thrill of Possibility. Two mana for an instant at common. As an additional cost to cast it. The discard card to draw to. So has been reprinted quite a few times now. And it's always playable at the very least. At its best in kind of your blue-red spells archetype. And uh, yeah, not much more to say about it. Fine filler card to maybe improve your hand slightly. Bladegraft Aspirant, 2 and a red for a 2-3 Phyrexian Warrior at common with Menace. Says equipment spells you cast cost 1 less to cast. So perfect in your 4 Mirrodin decks. And activated abilities of equipment you control that target. The Aspirant also get a 1 mana discount. Good recipient of equipment. Menace is a nice keyword, especially if we can improve its power. And uh, discounting equipment is relevant. So you can maybe curve Aspirant into a 5 mana equipment on turn 4. Which is quite the upgrade. So for the dedicated artifact decks, this seems very good and a pretty high pick. Outside of it, not that impressive. But I think still C plus overall. Forge Hammer Centurion, 2 and a red for a 3-2 Phyrexian Warrior at common. Says whenever another creature or artifact we control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, can put an oil counter on it. And when it attacks, we can remove two oil counters from it. If we do, target creature cannot block this turn. Yeah, this one doesn't quite do it for me. Two oil counters means this has to stay in play for a while and see a couple creatures die. And by that point, the opponent probably has a pretty developed board, so preventing one creature from blocking is not gonna make a huge difference. And in the meantime, we had a 3-mana three 3-2 three in play, which is kind of below the curve in terms of stats. And while there may be other ways to add more oil counters to it, it's still not that impressive. So I think I'm actually going to give this a D. Just doesn't quite cut it. 
Furnace Punisher is 2 in a red for a 3-3 Phyrexian Warrior at Uncommon, has Menace, and at the beginning of each player's upkeep, the Punisher deals 2 damage to that player unless they control 2 or more basic lines. This feels more like a card for Constructed, where people are playing lots of non-basics. Of course, in Limited, it's still a 3-mana 3-3 three three with Menace, which is fine. Nothing exciting, but totally playable. Give it a C. Koldotha Cackler is 2 and a red for a 2-3 Fraxen Hyena at common, has Trample, and when the Cackler attacks it gets plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is the number of permanents you control with oil counters on them. Hopefully you've got one or two and can attack for three or four Trample. Opponents will most likely trade for it if that's the case, and maybe you've got a couple points going through. So, yeah, fine playable for the red-green oil counter deck especially, I imagine. Give it a C. Magmatic Sprinter is one of the more interesting designs in this set, I think. Two in a red for a 3-2 Phyrexian Warrior at Uncommon. It has haste, and when it enters the battlefield, put two oil counters on a target artifact or creature you control. You can even put the counters on the Sprinter itself, because at the beginning of your end step, Return Sprinter to its owner's hand, unless you remove two oil counters from it. You can play it turn 3, hit the opponent for 3, and then keep it in play for an extra turn. On the following turn it doesn't have any oil counters left, so you'll have to pick it back up end of turn. But in the late game, let's say you have a different card that needs oil counters to function, and to get some advantage, then now you can play Sprinter, put the oil counters on a different creature, just to put more oil counters on it, and then end of turn pick it back up, next turn just replay it, get more oil counters going. So this could be a nice mana sink in the late game. And of course it can still potentially get in for 3 occasionally, once the opponent knows about it. I'm sure they'll leave a blocker back. But it still offers a ton of versatility, and you can still play it early as well to get some damage in. So yeah, quite a, a versatile card, and I like a C plus for Sprinter. Rebel Salvo is 2 in a red for an instant and uncommon, has affinity for equipment. Okay, so 3 mana is already pretty cheap, but we can potentially get it down to a single red mana if we control 2 or more equipment. And then Salvo deals 5 damage to a creature or planeswalker, and that permanent also loses indestructible until end of turn. So if the opponent gets one of those mythic rare Phyrexians in play, goes through the effort of actually making them indestructible. Rebel Salvo is like, nah, you still die. Yeah, this card's very good. Even without any extra text, just 3 mana instant deal 5 damage would be a B. It's still a B, but a very good one at that. Slowbat Iron Goblin, 2 in a red for a 3-3 legendary fraction Goblin Artificer at rare. Can tap, sacrifice an artifact, and then we add an amount of a red mana equal to the sacrifice artifact's mana value. Spend this mana only to cast artifact spells or activate abilities of artifacts. So it's mostly just a 3 mana 3-3. Three, three. On occasion it can maybe ramp you a little bit, but there's not a ton of expensive artifacts, especially not in red. Yeah, just a C, 3 mana 3-3 three, three for the most part. Ourobrask Forge is 2 and a red for an, a rare artifact and says at the beginning of combat on your turn, put an oil counter on the forge, and then create an X1 red Phyrexian horror creature token with trample and haste, where X is the number of oil counters on the forge, sacrifice that token at the beginning of the next end step. So it starts out pretty slow, make a 1-1 haste, sacrifice it, 2-1 haste trample, 3-1 haste trample, but yeah, if you get it to the late game, if you played it early at least, it does eventually get its damage across if the opponent doesn't have large enough blockers back. Can maybe sacrifice the tokens to some of your sacrifice synergies, especially in red-black. And so you can maybe proliferate to add even more oil counters to it so the tokens grow a little faster. So Forge has potential. If you top deck it late it's a bit underwhelming since it's gonna take a while for it to be relevant. But uh, I'll go with C plus on the Forge. Volt Charge is 2 in a red for an instant at common, dealing 3 damage to any target, and we get to proliferate. So yeah, this is kind of your bread and butter common removal spell in red that often gets to the B range, just because of how efficient it is 
3 mana, 3 damage, instant speed, and we even get to proliferate, and maybe get some more oil counters. So any red deck is going to be very happy with it. Blue-red spells, perfect. Red-green oil counters, still very good. So even the equipment decks will be happy with 3 damage at instant speed. Awaken the Sleeper is 3 and a red for a uncommon sorcery, and this is the act of treason of the set. So gain control of target creature until end of turn, untap that creature, it gains haste until end of turn, and this also has the extra text. If it's equipped, you may destroy all equipment attached to that creature. Which is a little sad, because if you do destroy the equipment, it means you don't get the bonus from the equipment when your creature is attacking, which you would otherwise get. But uh, yeah, it's very good against a four Mirrodin mechanic. Steal a creature, take out the equipment, maybe sacrifice the 2-2 Rebel. And uh, yeah, this can easily catch the opponent off guard if they don't leave enough blockers back. But uh, still at its best in the red-black sacrifice deck, which may have other ways to sacrifice a creature afterwards before giving it back. So we'll go with C plus for Awaken the Sleeper. Always have to be scared of these effects when facing... Red black especially. Chimney Rebel, three and a red for a three three Fraxing Goblin Warrior at common, has haste. And when it enters the battlefield, create a one one red Fraxing Goblin creature token. Yeah, this seems pretty good. Get in for three, leave back a one one. Now at four mana, three three haste. Doesn't always get to attack profitably, but especially if you're on the play, this should be able to. And then the token that's left behind can maybe be sacrificed for certain effects. Probably still just a C, but uh, especially in red-black this should be quite good. Hazardous Blast, 3 in red for a common sorcery, dealing 1 damage to each creature your opponent's control, and creatures your opponent's control cannot block this turn. So yeah, this can be a useful finisher in the red aggressive decks. But you typically don't want more than one of them, and one damage to each creature can be a useful way to finish off some uh, tokens as well. Yep, essentially a functional reprint of Cosmotronic Wave. Only probably want this in the more aggressive red decks. Um, don't know if Blue Red is all that interested, since that deck probably has a few flyers and doesn't need to effect to prevent blocking as much. So, gets a C. Koth, Fire of Resistance, probably one of the least exciting Planeswalkers for Limited as well, just because it kind of forces you to go mono red almost to get the most out of it. So 4 mana, 4 loyalty, plus 1 to find a mountain, put it in your hand, minus 3 to deal damage to a creature equal to the number of mountains you control, and then the minus 7 can also be game winning if you can get to it. Outside of mono red, let's say you've got an even split, on 4 mana it can maybe deal 2 damage, and then on the following turn it does start getting more mountains at least to enable the minus 3. But in a mono red deck this is amazing, so hopefully that's the case. And then this will uh, easily take over the game, but it is quite the commitment unfortunately. So I think Koth falls somewhere in the probably C plus range. You want to take it early and build around it. But if you're presented a Koth mid to late in the draft, then you may still consider playing it, but it's not automatically going to make the cut. But uh, yeah, definitely has potential. So C plus seems fine. Solfim Mayhem Dominus, 4 mana for a 5-4 Legendary Fraxian Horror at Mythic. It says if a source you control would deal non-combat damage to an opponent or a permanent an opponent controls, it doubles that damage instead, and we can pay one double Fraxin, discard two cards to put an indestructible counter on Solfim. So, you can maybe wait until five mana to make it indestructible right away if you're afraid of removal. Now the problem is, how many effects are there in the sets that deal non-combat damage? We've seen the one drop that can maybe deal one damage, which would now deal two damage. We've seen a couple burn spells. But uh, more of a build around for constructed than for limited. Still, of course, pretty decent. Say 5 4 for 4 that can turn indestructible, maybe by discarding some cards you don't need. So it's still quite good, but uh, I don't think it's quite bomb territory like we had with some of the previous 
uh, legendaries, so I'll go with a B for Solfim. Ourobrask Anointer is 4 mana for a 4-2 artifact Phyrexian Wizard at Uncommon. And when the Anointer enters the battlefield, it deals X damage to any target where X is the number of permanents you control with oil counters on them. Sadly, does not have an oil counter itself. But uh, yeah, has the potential of being kind of a Flame Tongue Cavu like creature, which is always very powerful. Even if it only deals, let's say, 2 damage, it can often take something out, which is great. And then you've got a 4 2 left over. But it does require a bit of work. So it will be at its best in blue reds and red green, I believe. So I think we'll uh, end up with C plus for Anointer. Has a potential of being like a B if your deck is fully going with oil counter synergies. But if we're being realistic, I think C+. Voltshock Splitter, 3 and a red for a common equipment. And comes with a 2-2 Rebel attached to it, giving it plus 2 power. So 4 mana for a 4-2 essentially, and then it equips for 2 and a red. So plus 2 power is a relevant bonus. Especially if you can put it on an evasive creature, maybe on a first strike or double strike creature. So Splitter seems like one of the better common equipments, especially for the red-white archetype. So I'll give it a C+. And then we've got All Will Be One 5 mana Mythic Rare Enchantment. It says whenever we put one or more counters on a permanent or player, this enchantment deals that much damage to target opponent, creature an opponent controls, or planeswalker an opponent controls. Okay, so... How do we add counters? Well, there's oil counters, of course. That's one way to enable all will be one. If we proliferate, that can also be quite impressive if we have a few creatures with oil counters on them, because then we get to deal a ton of damage. Maybe we get lucky and combine this with a planeswalker. As we add more loyalty counters, we can deal more damage. And uh, poison counters can also trigger it, but problem is... Red is not all that into putting the poison counters on the opponent. So, definitely a build around card. It's not going to be amazing in every red deck, but especially in a deck with both oil counters and proliferate, so probably blue red. This could be a pretty nice engine that keeps dealing damage over and over. So, we'll give it a, a B for all will be one. Dragonwing Glider is next. 5 mana rare artifact equipment with 4 Mirrodin, giving plus 2 plus 2, flying and haste. So we get a 4-4 four, four flying haste for 5, that's great. And then we still have the equipment left over if the opponent answers our token. Pretty pricey to move the equipment, it's 5 mana. But uh, yeah, the effect is certainly worth it. This feels like a bomb. Give it an A. And then there's a Furnace Strider, 5 mana for a 4-5 Phyrexian Beast at common. Enters with two oil counters on it, and we can remove an oil counter to give target creature we control haste until end of turn. So it essentially has haste itself, and then we'll still have an oil counter left over to give a future creature haste. And 4-5 haste for 5, give another creature haste, sounds pretty amazing. So C plus for Strider. Molten Rebuke, 5 mana... For a common sorcery, get to choose one or both, deal 5 damage to a creature or planeswalker, or destroy target equipment. The versatility is nice, although not quite as exciting as it used to be, as uh, creatures get better and better. So we're paying a bit of a premium here. I think I'm gonna end up giving Rebuke a C. Just not quite efficient enough to be in the top tier of kind of removal spells, if you will. Then there's the Resistance Skywarden, 5 mana, 5-5 five, five, Ogre, Rebel, and Uncommon, has Menace and Reach. So, pretty simple, but pretty effective, will help against pesky flyers, Menace makes it harder to block profitably, and uh, yeah, 5 mana, 5-5, five, five. decent stats, so don't have a whole lot to complain about. We'll give the Skyhunter a C+. Then there's the Capricious Hellraiser, 6 mana, 4-4 four, four flyer, gets a 3 mana discount if we have a 9 or more cards in our graveyard. Could come up and limit it, but don't count on it, so mostly gonna cost 6 mana. And when it enters, exile 3 cards at random from your graveyard, 
choose a non-creature non-land card from among them, and we get to copy it and cast it for free. Not bad. So there's always the risk that we don't exile any non-creature spells that we can actually cast for free with a Hellraiser. So that can certainly happen. Has a potential of being a 6 mana 4-4 four, four flyer that gets back a removal spell, which could be amazing. So I think it has the potential of being a bomb for sure. So we'll give it an A. And then there's the Oxida finisher, 7 mana, 7-5, seven Ogre Rebel at Uncommon with affinity for equipment once again. So ideally we've got like two equipment in play, maybe even three, and then get to play this for four or five mana. But uh, yeah, realistic scenario, you're playing the equipment deck, you've got two out there, and then play this on turn five as a 7-5 Trampler. That's pretty good. So I like a C plus at least for the finisher. And then our final red card is Red Sun's Twilight, X and double red for a rare sorcery to destroy up to X target artifacts. If X is 5 or more, for each artifact destroyed this way we get to create a token that's a copy, and those tokens gain haste, exile them at the beginning of the next end step. Well, there's quite a few artifacts in the set, so it's realistic for us to be able to take out multiples with Twilight, and uh, if we're in the late game, we get to maybe copy a few creatures, get an attack in, could be fun. So Twilight seems definitely very playable, although there will be matchups where it just doesn't have any targets, which could be a little awkward. So I'm hesitant to give it a super high rating. I'm happy to main deck a Twilight, but I accept the risk of not having any targets for the scenarios where it's a complete blowout, basically. So that's my final verdict. First green card, Evolving Adaptive, is a 1 mana Phyrexian Warrior at Uncommon. Starts out as a 0 0 with an oil counter on it, and it gets plus 1 plus 1 for each oil counter on it. So essentially a 1 1. And then whenever another creature enters a battlefield under our control, if that creature has greater power or toughness than the Adaptive, put an oil counter on the Adaptive. So. Reminiscent of Pelt Collector, will slowly grow over time and uh, can turn into quite a threat. And uh, best case scenario, play this on turn one, just curve out and beat face. So pretty powerful card if you can uh, build your deck around it a little bit. It's going to be at its best in kind of the red-green oil counter archetype, which also just happens to have a lot of large creatures that can grow it. So. I think this is deserving of a B, a one drop that just scales beautifully over time, has a lot of upside. Then there's the Incubation Sack, one mana, uncommon artifact, enters with three oil counters on it, can pay four mana, tap it, remove an oil counter to create a 3-3 colorless Phyrexian Golem artifact creature token, can only use it at sorcery speed. So pretty expensive to get your first 3-3 three, three token, but it does kind of add up over time. Eventually it's going to be 30 mana to get 3 tokens, but maybe you even have a way to proliferate and keep making more. So it is a powerful mana sink in those stalled boards, and uh, yeah, those tokens definitely add up. So going to be probably at its best in kind of a blue-green proliferate deck where you can keep making more tokens, but even outside of it it's probably playable still. So we'll uh, go with a C plus for Incubation Sack. I think it's actually pretty decent. Rustvine Cultivator, 1 mana, 1, 2, Fraction Alpha Druid at common. Can tap to put an oil counter on it. Can tap, remove an oil counter to untap target land. So in limited, most of our lands just make 1 mana, but it's still a way to essentially make 1 extra mana if we tap the land first to float our mana with it. So every two turns we can make one extra mana, but we can also maybe store up some oil counters for other synergies on a 1-2 for one mana. So it doesn't fix our mana necessarily, uh, since it's still limited by the lands we have in play, but it can maybe help, let's say if we have one mountain out, it can make double red to help cast a double red spell, which we otherwise maybe couldn't cast. So that's neat. So yeah, it's a definitely a relevant one-drop, gonna be at its best in red-green, 
but even outside of it, maybe blue-green proliferate can make good use of it as an early creature that helps you ramp. So it's probably better than it looks. Am I willing to give it a C plus? Eh, probably still just a C, but a pretty good one at that. Thirsting Roots is a one mana sorcery at common. Can choose one, search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, and put it into your hand. Or we can proliferate, kind of a lay of the land, search for land, but also has additional utility. In this case, we can proliferate. Not sure how often we're actually going to end up proliferating, but having the option is nice. And especially in like a three plus color deck, this can maybe help fix our mana. But even a two color deck is probably still happy to have this. If you have enough green sources, just cut a land for it, and then it's basically acting as a tap land, but just make sure you have enough green to begin with, since uh, you don't want the disaster of having like a mountain in hand and then roots as your quote-unquote second land. But uh, yeah, I think it's good and definitely playable. Give it a C. Venerated Rot Priest, one mana, one, two, Frax and Druid at rare with Toxic, one. Always nice to have Toxic on your one drops to get the poison damage in early. And whenever a creature we control becomes the target of a spell, target opponent gets a poison counter. So it works both with pump spells as well as maybe removal spells that the opponent tries to cast. And the uh, poison counters can quickly add up. So yeah, Rot Priest seems like a pretty important card for kind of the green-white uh, toxic aggro archetype. But also very good on the black-green deck, which can maybe just win the game by poisoning the opponent. So C plus at the very least for Rot Priest. Armored Scrap Gorger, two mana, O3, Phyrexian Beast at Uncommon, and gets plus three plus O as long as it has three or more oil counters on it. Taps and one mana of any color, and whenever it becomes tapped, exile target card from a graveyard and put an oil counter on the Scrap Gorger. Now it doesn't seem to be optional to exile cards from graveyards, so keep that in mind. But I guess a bit of graveyard hate never hurt. And uh, yeah, eventually turns into a 3-3, but you're probably pretty happy with just a 2-mana creature that generates an extra mana. So a Scrap Gorger seems great, easily a C+. Then we've got the Branch Blight Stalker, 2-mana, 3-1 Phyrexian Elf Scout at common with Toxic 2. So if this hits the opponent, it uh, will quickly add up those uh, poison counters. So it's a creature that the opponent cannot really ignore, especially if you've got a poison deck. But it is still just a one-toughness creature, doesn't block particularly well, and most creatures will be able to trade for it. So it does have a couple uh, limitations. So just a C, I think, for Stalker. Then there's the Canker Bloom, one and a green for a 3-2 Phyrexian Fungus at Uncommon. So yeah, two mana, three, two, already pretty decent. But there's more. For one mana, we can sacrifice it to either destroy an artifact, an enchantment, or proliferate. So it offers quite a bit of extra utility on a 2-drop. So this one seems quite decent, and uh, at the very least a C+. Copper Long Legs, 1 and a green for a 1-3 Phyrexian Spider at common, has reach. For 1 and a green, we can sacrifice it to proliferate. Yeah, just an early reach creature to hold off some small pesky flyers and then late game if it no longer has a use we can still maybe proliferate and that can help out totally fine playable gets a c infectious bite one of the more exciting removal spells in green one on a green for an instant at uncommon saying target creature we control deals damage equal to its power to target creature we don't control and each opponent gets a poison counter so yeah pretty great for any deck that deals with uh, poison counters, of course, but also great with any death touch creatures, for instance, which can immediately take out an opposing creature with it. And uh, green tends to have some large creatures that have a lot of power, so Infectious Bind gets a B. Predation Steward, one on a green for a 2 2 Phyrexian Elf Warrior at common, enters with two oil counters on it. And for 2 and a green we can tap, remove an oil counter from it to give a creature plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn at sorcery speed. A 2 drop that has late game utility always has my attention, and this seems like a pretty good one, so we'll give it a C plus. 
Ruthless Predation is another kind of fight effect at 2 mana. This one's an actual fight, one and a green for a sorcery at common, giving plus 1 plus 2 until end of turn, and then our creature fights an opposing creature. Still very good. Sometimes it will actually be better than the uh, one we've just covered, the Infectious Bite, since you actually want the extra power. This one actually fights, so there is the potential that your creature ends up trading, um, and it's a sorcery, so you wouldn't be able to necessarily play that instant speed to maybe help in the middle of combat, but still very good and easily a B. Titanic Growth, also a very powerful combat trick, 2 mana, instant at common, giving plus 4, plus 4 until end of turn. Still hesitant to give it more than a C. Your deck only really has room for so many of these combat tricks, since you still need a good balance of creatures as well. But uh, yeah, I'll happily play one or two Titanic Growths in my green deck. Give it a C. Unnatural Restoration, one in a green for an uncommon a sorcery that returns target permanent card from our graveyard to our hand, and we proliferate. So sadly, it doesn't get back removal spells necessarily, but green decks often just want to get back their big creature anyway. So this can help, and then proliferate kind of an extra little bonus. So Restoration seems totally playable. Is it exciting enough for a C plus? Eh, probably still just a C, I think. Next up we have Adaptive Spore Singer, two and a green for a 2-2 Phyrexian Druid at common with Vigilance. And when it enters, we either give a creature plus two plus two and Vigilance until end of turn, or we get to Proliferate instead. So a bit of flexibility. A 2-2 Vigilance, not the biggest creature itself. So the Vigilance on the Spore Singer doesn't feel super necessary, I guess, but it's just upside. And then being able to pump something else when it enters is nice, and can always proliferate if we are dealing with oil counters or poison instead. So pretty well-rounded 3-drop, but definitely benefits from having a 2-drop to play beforehand to get the extra damage in, especially early when we may not want to proliferate yet. So playable, just gets a C, don't think it's quite a C+. Plus. A bloated contaminator, one of the more exciting green rares, 3 mana, 4-4 four, four Fraxian Beast with Trample, Toxic 1, and when it deals combat damage to a player, we also get to proliferate. So yeah, perfect for pretty much every green deck, good with oil counters, good with poison, good stats, nothing to complain about, definitely a bomb, gets an A. Carnivorous Canopy, 2 and a green for a common sorcery, can destroy target artifact, enchantment, or creature with flying, and if the mana value was 3 or less we also get to proliferate. Probably a one-off that I wouldn't mind main decking, green sometimes struggles with opposing flying creatures, and plenty of artifacts to take out in this set, so it should be okay to play one in the main deck, so we'll give it a C. Contagious Vorak, 2 and a green for a 3-3 Phyrexian Boar Beast at common. And when it enters the battlefield, we get to take a look at the top four cards of our library, reveal a land card from among them, put it into our hand, and the rest on the bottom in a random order. If we did not put a card in our hand this way, we get to proliferate instead. So we don't have to reveal a land if we would rather proliferate, which is nice. And a 3 mana 3-3 three three that essentially draws a land seems great. So... Easily a C plus for Vorak. Akerspit Basilisk is 2 and a green for a 1-3 with Death Touch at common and Toxic 1. And Toxic and Death Touch kind of go hand in hand. Makes it less likely that the opponent wants to block our Basilisk and we get to inflict poison instead. So seems like a fine playable, gets a C. Maze's Mantle, 2 and a green for an enchantment aura at common that we can play at instant speed to enchant our creature, giving it plus 2 plus 2, but if the enchanted creature has toxic, that creature also gains hexproof until end of turn. It's a kind of an instant speed combo trick, but a kind of expensive one at 3 mana, so can be punished more easily than a cheaper combo trick, um, but it does stick around, so best case scenario, can blow out an opposing creature in the middle of combat and then keep a larger creature left over, but even then maybe a removal spell still takes care of it, 
and it sort of ended up being a 2 for 2 trade. So not super high on the Maze's Mantle, usually not a fan of auras in general unless they're incredibly impactful. This one just seems okay. We'll give it a C. A viral spawning to an a green for an uncommon sorcery, creating a 3-3 green Fraxian Beast creature token with Toxic 1. Okay, and then if we have Corrupted enabled, we can also flash it back from our graveyard for two and a green. So the only flashback card in the set, I believe. But uh, yeah, pretty good card in general. Green has quite a few toxic enablers and decks that care about poison. And uh, the three mana part that initially makes a beast is already playable. And the flashback is just extra value. And you know how I feel about extra value. So spawning gets a B. Conduit of Worlds is an interesting one. 4 mana artifact at rare lets us play a lands from our graveyard. Now there's not a ton of effects that mill cards in green like there maybe were in previous sets and not that many discard effects either. So don't think the land part is going to be super relevant. But then we can tap, choose target a non-land permanent card in our graveyard. If we haven't cast a spell this turn we may cast that card. If we do we cannot cast additional spells this turn but can only be used as a sorcery. So the way I see this is as a very slow source of card advantage in creature-heavy decks mostly that just want to get back creatures from the graveyard. And then once you're out of cards to play from hand, then you can use a conduit to maybe replay creatures that died. So could be a pretty great source of card advantage. A little bit slow to get going admittedly, but uh, in a grindy game this can quickly add up. Just need to find the right home for it. Ideally, a deck with a lot of big creatures. So I'll give it a B, and we'll see how it plays out. Evolved Spinoderm, 4 mana, 5-5 five, five, Phyrexian Beast at a rare. And the Spinoderm enters a battlefield with 4 oil counters on it. And has Trample as long as it has 2 or fewer oil counters on it. Otherwise, it has Hexproof. So it starts out as a Hexproof creature, and then slowly transforms into a Trampler. But at the beginning of your upkeep, we have to remove an oil counter from it. If it has no oil counters left, we have to sacrifice it, unfortunately. So best case scenario, we can maybe proliferate a few times to keep it around, or maybe kill the opponent in the meantime. But there will be games where maybe the board is stalled, it doesn't have any profitable attacks, and then it just kind of fades away, and we have to sacrifice it, and then we aren't too happy about it. So a card with a lot of potential, if you can play it on turn 4 especially, and it's great in a proliferate deck, but there will be times when it's a little bit less uh, exciting. So I think I land on a, a C plus for the Spinoderm. Next up we have Expand the Sphere, 3 and a green uncommon sorcery. Look at the top 6 cards of our library, put up to 2 land cards from among them onto the battlefield, tapped. But if we put fewer than 2 lands onto the battlefield this way, we get to proliferate a number of times equal to the difference. We've had a similar ramp card before that's currently in standard, I think the Cartographer's Survey, which I think looks at the top 7 cards. That one had about a 90% hit rate in your average deck of finding 2 lands. This one only looks at the top 6, so there's a pretty significant difference. So we may only be around 80% to hit 2 lands with it, which presumably is what you want out of your 4 mana ramp sorcery. Now there's not a ton of super expensive cards in the set, so not a lot of decks want a 4 mana ramp 2 effect, but uh, for the few decks that do want it, you may end up being a bit disappointed when it only finds one land in the top 6, and then if you do miss, hopefully at least a proliferate will make up for it. So it's not a complete disaster, still not a card that most green decks will need, um, but uh, the ones that do should be able to pick it up pretty late, so we'll give it a C. Lattice Blade Mantis, 4 mana, 4, 3. Fraxian Insect at common. Enters with two oil counters. And when it attacks, we can remove an oil counter to give it plus one plus one until end of turn and untap it. So it's kind of pseudo vigilance. Turns into a 5 4. Yeah, that hits pretty hard for a 4 mana creature. And uh, if we can keep proliferating more counters, it can keep attacking as a 5 4 and play defense at the same time. Seems quite good. I think still probably just a C, but a pretty good one at that. 
Plague Nurse, 4 mana, 3, 4, Phyrexian Cleric at common with Toxic, 2, and for 2 and a green, each other creature we control with Toxic gains Toxic 1 until end of turn, can only activate it once each turn, so can give uh, extra Toxic, which means extra poison counters, since I guess Toxic stacks additional uh, instances of Toxic means extra poison counters, which is nice. 3, 4, 4, 4, not the worst stance, could be better, but... Uh, yeah, Toxic 2 means this is perfect for those Poison Synergy decks, and uh, especially pairs nicely with some of the smaller evasive creatures, if we can double up on Toxic with the activated ability here. Still probably just a C at the end of the day, but the decks that want it should be able to pick it up. Venomous Brutalizer, 4 mana, 4-4 four, four, Phyrexian Knight at Uncommon with Toxic 3, so the numbers are going up here. And when it enters the battlefield, we can pay one and a green. If we do, proliferate. Pretty simple, but pretty effective. Fine to play at four mana. And in the late game, if we want to proliferate, it's only six. Still get a four four with toxic three. So the versatility here seems pretty great. And uh, yeah, we'll go with a B for Brutalizer. Noxious Assault is a five mana uncommon sorcery, giving creatures we control plus two plus two until end of turn. And whenever a creature blocks this turn, its controller gets a poison counter. So it could be a great finisher for especially like a green-white deck that can maybe go wide with a few might tokens to discourage the opponent from blocking or give them poison counters either way. I think green-white is definitely the best home for Noxious Assault. It shouldn't be in super high demand. So I think uh, C plus at the most for Noxious Assault. Oil Gorger Troll is a 5 mana 3 5 Phyrexian Troll Warrior at common. When it enters the battlefield, you gain 3 life. Okay, that's nice. And then if you control a permanent with an oil counter on it, we also get to draw a card. Okay, is this uh, Owl Bear coming back? Of course, a bit of a restriction here. We need an oil counter in play. But especially in red green, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Blue green also has quite a few. Maybe not the best in green-white, which wants to go wide anyways. And uh, I guess black-green may also not have a ton of oil counters, but uh, still seems like an awesome card in a lot of the different green decks, providing card advantage and a bit of life when it enters. And 3-4, not the worst stance, assuming it replaces itself. So I think I'm willing to give this a B. And then there's Thrun, Breaker of Silence. Very powerful troll as well. 5-5 five, five, Trampler at rare. It's legendary, cannot be countered, and it also cannot be the target of non-green spells your opponents control or abilities from non-green sources your opponents control. So it's hexproof except for green spells and abilities can still target it. And as long as it's our turn, Thrun also has indestructible. Well, this seems like uh, a nightmare for the opponent to deal with. The only way you really lose with a Thrun out is if the opponents happen to have like a green fight effect to take it out, or maybe they just have a lot of flying creatures and they can just kind of fly over and outrace you, or maybe go wide and still attack past it, but in most uh, board states Thrun is going to be a headache for the opponent, easily A for bomb status. Tyranax Atrocity, 5 mana, 4-4 four, four, Frankston Dinosaur at common with haste and toxic 3. Getting in with uh, haste is always nice, and the opponent may not play around a haste creature, especially toxic 3 could be nice in the poison decks. So this adds up very quickly, and will force the opponent to all of a sudden have to play defense after taking 3 poison, since that uh, can kill the opponent in a few attacks. So C plus for Atrocity. Sky Scythe and Golfer, 6 mana, 6 5 Phyrexian Beast at common with Reach and Trample, and it cannot be blocked by creatures with flying. Pretty good. Kind of expensive, probably would have preferred the extra toughness over a couple of those extra abilities and just have Colossal Dreadmaw back, but uh, I guess we'll settle for the Engolfer, gets a C. Now the Silvok Battle Chair seems great, 6 mana, uncommon equipment with 4 Mirrodin, giving the equipped creature plus 4 plus 4 and Trample. 
So there's our Colossal Dreadmaw, 6 mana, 6-6 six, six, Trample, and it's still an equipment, so for 7 mana we can move it around if that's necessary. So Battle Chair seems great, easily a B. And then there's Nissa, Ascended Animist, can be played for 5, 6 or 7 mana depending on how much life we want to pay and how much loyalty we need. Plus 1 to create an XX Green Frexian Horror Creature Token where X is Nissa's loyalty. So we do get the extra loyalty before deciding how big the token's going to be. So let's say we play Nissa for 5 mana and 4 life, then it enters with 3 loyalty, then the plus 1 will make a 4-4 four, four token, still pretty good, and that will only get bigger over time. The minus 1 can destroy an artifact or enchantment, plenty of artifacts in the set, and the minus 7, which we can maybe activate right away if we played N Nissa for 7 mana, we get to give the team plus 1 plus 1, for each forest we control, as well as trample. So best case scenario, we're a mono green deck, but even outside of a mono green deck, by the time we activate the minus seven, we might have like three or four forests in play. Still better than an overrun. So very powerful, easily gets an A, and I think I'm even willing to go for an S for Nissa, just because it has the potential to just end the game if we cast it for seven mana. Then a Paladin of Predation, is 7 mana for a 6-7 Phyrexian Knight at Uncommon with Toxic 6. That's the highest Toxic number we've seen so far, so it only takes 2 attacks to kill an opponent. And it also cannot be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less, so it's going to be a lot harder to chum block, especially with Death Touch creatures, which can be kind of a weakness of large green creatures that don't have Trample especially. So Paladin does not mess around, seems quite good. Give it a C+. Plus. Could be a great curve topper for the poison decks. And then Tyranax Rex. Speaking of curve toppers, 7 mana, 8-8. Eight, eight. Cannot be countered, has Trample, Ward 4, and Haste, as well as Toxic 4. So we'll usually get its first attack in successfully, and then the opponent may be able to answer it if they have a cheap enough removal spell. It's not always going to be easy. And then, uh, yeah, Toxic 4, I guess, is just upside, although you're probably killing the opponent with damage before you kill them with poison in this case. Also cannot be countered, so that's also pure upside. Not that there's a ton of counter spells in the set. But uh, yeah, powerful bomb. Give it an A. A little bit pricey, but green might have a few ways of ramping into it at least. And then there's the Hunger Dominus. Zapondril, 7 mana for a 4-6 legendary Phyrexian Horror at Mythic, has reach, and at the beginning of each combat, double the power and toughness of each creature you control until end of turn. We've seen this before in enchantment form, now stapled onto a creature, and for 2 Phyrexian green mana, we can sacrifice 2 other creatures to put an indestructible counter on the Hunger Dominus. Yeah, very powerful effect if you can get it down, will easily take over a game. Reach means you kind of shore up some of the weaknesses of green, has a bit of a stabilizing effect, and by the time you can play the Hunger Dominus, you probably have two creatures in play that you can sacrifice if you really want to save it. So definitely another bomb level card, although there are still answers out there, so don't know if I'm quite willing to go to an S. Easier to interact with creatures than Planeswalkers. We've got Green Sun's Twilight, X and a green for a rare sorcery, Reveal the top X plus one cards from your library. Choose a creature card and or a land card from among them. Put those cards on into your hands and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So this has the potential to be a two for one if you reveal both a land and a creature. Of course, the higher the X, the more likely you find both creature and land. And then if X is five or more, instead put the chosen cards onto the battlefield or into your hand and the rest on the bottom in a random order. So now instead of putting the card in hand, you can put it straight onto the battlefield, which is a nice upside. Of course, has a bit of constructed potential to try and cheat some very expensive creatures in play as early as, I guess, you have six mana. But for limited, you know, I guess you have the Tyranax Rex and the other seven drop that you can maybe put in play a turn early. But for the most part, we're still just happy with a mana discount in a way and uh, a nice two for one hopefully finding a land and a creature at the same time so twilight's good um early game it's not that impressive so it's really a card you want to sink a bunch of mana into to dig deeper for your more exciting creatures 
so the later you cast it probably the better but uh, still a C plus for Twilight and then the actual final green card is Tyvar's Stand X and a green for an uncommon instant and then a target creature you control gets plus X plus X and gains hexproof and indestructible until end of turn so very flexible can cast it for X equals zero if we just want hexproof and indestructible but can sink more mana into it and uh, potentially deal X extra damage if we're attacking which can be quite useful so as far as comma tricks go this is a very good one we'll give it a C plus so now it is time to take a look at artifacts and lands. First artifact is part of a cycle, Basilica, Skull Bomb, one mana to play, and then one mana to sacrifice to draw a card, but we can also sacrifice it for two and a white instead, in which case a creature we control gets plus two plus two and gains flying until end of turn, still get to draw a card, can only be used as a sorcery. So I think all the spell bombs, as we'll see, are quite good um, they can be played early in the case of the artifact synergy deck enable some artifact synergies in the case of the red black sacrifice deck it can maybe enable some effects that care about artifacts leaving the battlefield and going to the graveyard and then they all offer a bit of utility there's not a ton of one drops in the set so usually don't mind playing it turn one and then later you've got a little bit of a mana sink to spend more mana so these are all c plus Skull Bomb plus two plus two and flying until end of turn for two and a white. We've got the Surgical Skull Bomb, which is a blue one for two and a blue. We can bounce an opposing creature to its owner's hand at sorcery speed. The Dross Skull Bomb is a black one for two and a black. We can return a creature from our graveyard to our hand and still draw a card as well. There's Furnace Skull Bomb for one and a red. So we can put two oil counters on the target artifact or creature we control, still draw. And then finally, the Maze Skull Bomb, which is a green one for two and a green. Target creature we control gets plus three plus three and gains trample until end of turn. And we draw. So these are all C. Next is the Prosthetic Injector, one mana, uncommon equipment. Equipped creature gets plus O plus two and has Toxic One, equips for just one mana. Now I think having to play an equipment to grant Toxic. Is probably not where you want to be in most decks. Two extra toughness is nice, but it's probably not worth the card, even if it's relatively cheap to equip still. So maybe a very dedicated toxic deck just wants as many extra toxic effects as possible, because this will stack onto other toxic abilities. Yeah, not convinced by the injector, so we'll give it a D. Next is the Dune Mover, which is another way to potentially fix your mana in a multicolor deck. So it's a 2 mana, 2-1 two artifact creature Phyrexian Golem at common with Toxic 1, just a little bit of upside. And when it enters the battlefield, we may search our library for a basic land card, reveal it, shuffle, and then put it back on top of our deck. So it doesn't draw the card, sadly, but it still helps you set up your next turn. And since there's almost no mill effects, there's not really the risk of the opponent getting rid of it. So perfect for fixing your mana to maybe play Atraxa, who knows. But even in a two-color deck that wants to splash a third color, Dune Mover could be serviceable. One toughness, bit of a drawback in a set with a lot of might tokens, but it's still a two-drop that will be able to trade for most opposing two-drops. So like C for Dune Mover. Monument to Perfection, 2 mana, a rare artifact, can pay 3 mana, tap, search your library for a basic sphere or a locus land and put it into our hand after revealing. So as we'll notice when going over the lands, the lands have a couple subtypes that they typically don't have, including sphere and locus. So the monument can potentially grab those. And then for 3 mana, the monuments can turn into a 9-9 nine, nine Phyrexian Construct Artifact Creature, loses all abilities and gains indestructible and toxic 9. But we can only activate this if there are 9 or more lands with different names among basics, spheres and locus lands we control. So pretty difficult card to make work in limited. You would need to pick up a lot of different basics in different colors, and also have drafted enough spheres and locus lands to be able to get to the nine different uh, names. So pretty difficult. Of course, the ability helps with that. 
So once you have the nine different lands in the deck, you can eventually search them up, but it's gonna take a lot of time and effort to get there. So I don't think it's really worth it. Could be a fun kind of side quest if you're deep into the format and are looking for an extra challenge, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it as kind of your first draft deck. Um, of course, still a source of extra lands if you need to keep hitting your land drops, but as we discussed, there's not a ton of expensive cards in the set. I guess there's a few more expensive green cards, which may need an extra land or two from the monument, but in general, I don't think you're really gonna struggle to hit your land drops and cast your spells, so monument doesn't seem very necessary. So I'll give it a D, but definitely an interesting card that could be a fun challenge. Next is the Mirror Convert, 2 mana, 2-1, two uncommon artifact creature Phyrexian Mirror with Toxic 1. Can tap it, pay 2 life to add 1 mana of any color. So it's a painful mana elf, if you will, but uh, yeah, helping you ramp in a format that doesn't have a ton of mana acceleration is still nice. Maybe get a Planeswalker in play, a turn ahead of schedule can make a huge difference in a game, so definitely worth a 2 life. And then at the end of the day it's still a 2 mana, 2-1, two so it's not the worst. So I think the Convert gets a C+. Prophetic Prism is back, 2 mana artifact at common when it enters draw card, and this will also fix our mana, so another great way to enable 3 and more colored decks. And uh, also very good in the blue-white artifact deck as just a 2 mana artifact that replaces itself, so that can maybe improve some of your synergies. So C+, for Prophetic Prism. Solus Jailer is kind of a sideboard hate card for constructed decks. 2 mana, 04, rare artifact creature, Fraxian Golem, says permanent cards in graveyards cannot enter the battlefield, and players cannot cast non creature spells from graveyards or exile. Don't think it's going to be super relevant and limited, so just a 2 mana, 04, not particularly exciting, gets a D. Then there's the Tablet of Completion, 2 mana rare artifact. Tap it, put an oil counter on the tablet. Tap it, adds a colorless mana, but can only activate it if it has two or more oil counters on it already. So turn two, play tablets, activate it, get an oil counter. Turn three, activate, get an oil counter. And then turn four is when we can finally actually ramp with it. So not particularly exciting. And then we can pay one mana tap, draw a card, but only if it has five or more counters on it. So it's going to be taking us quite a while to get to that point. So if we don't start with tablet on turn two, then you can probably forget about it. So not a huge fan of the tablet either, so we'll give it a D. Then the filigree Silex, two mana rare legendary artifact, can tap to put an oil counter on it. Tap and sacrifice to destroy each non-land permanent with mana value equal to the number of oil counters on the Silex. So very much uh, reminiscent of Ratchet Bomb, which has seen quite a bit of play over time. And then we can also tap, remove 10 oil counters from among permanents we control, and sacrifice Silex to deal 10 damage to any target. So that's a bit of extra upside if you do eventually get to 10 counters, which could happen if your deck proliferates a bunch as well. So Silex seems pretty good. Most decks will be happy to have it. Give it a C+. Then there's Zenith Chronicler, 2 mana, 3-1 artifact creature, Phyrexian Construct at rare. Says whenever a player casts their first multicolored spell each turn, each other player draws a card. So this is going to be at its best in a monocolored deck as a way to punish the opponent for casting multicolored spells. If you're playing a bunch of multicolor spells yourself, then you may want to exclude the Chronicler from your deck. But uh, yeah, assuming you're monocolored, a 2 mana 3 1 that occasionally draws an extra card seems pretty great. So give Chronicler a C, but be aware that sometimes you just uh, are not going to end up playing it if your deck has a bunch of multicolored spells itself. Atraxas Skitterfang, 3 mana, 2-2 two, two, artifact creature, Phyrexian Insect at Uncommon, enters with 3 oil counters on it, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, you may remove an oil counter from the Skitterfang to give a creature or choice of Flying, Vigilance, Death Touch, or a Life Link until end of turn. So incredibly versatile, all these could have their moments, but I imagine Flying probably one of the more relevant ones. So this is going to be amazing and kind of a red-green oil counter deck, blue-red probably 
also a great home for it. And uh, blue-green can also easily proliferate, add more oil counters, and give you more abilities over time. So I think Skitterfang might actually go up to a B, just because of the flexibility here. And then the Icar played Golem, 3 mana, 2, 3, artifact creature Phyrexian Golem at Uncommon. Whenever a creature enters a battlefield under our control, if it has one or more oil counters on it, put an oil counter on it. That's always nice. And creatures we control with oil counters on them get plus one plus one. So the Lord for oil seems pretty decent. Again, probably at its best in red-green and uh, blue-green and blue-reds also have their fair share of oil counters and another B. Then the Mirren safe house. We can just give an F and move on. Mirror Custodian, 3 mana, 2, 3, artifact creature mirror at common. When it enters, we get to scry 2, and then each opponent may scry 1. Yeah, not fond of uh, letting the opponent scry, especially when the creature we're getting is not particularly exciting to begin with. So we'll give the Custodian a D, but sometimes you're just short on playables and you'll still have to play this one. At least you can cast it in every deck, so... Maybe a playable for those decks trying to go monocolored to include some of those powerful bombs if you didn't end up with quite enough playables in the original color. Fraxin Atlas, 3 mana, common artifact, taps for 1 mana of any color, and with Corrupted it will also drain the opponent for 1. So don't expect a ton of decks to need 3 mana artifact ramp, but especially if your deck is trying to stretch into multiple colors. This could be a useful way to fix your mana, so we'll give it a C. Nothing inherently wrong with it. Then the Staff of Completion, I want to like, but can't quite get there. Three mana Mythic Rare Artifact, can tap it in a multitude of ways, can pay one life tap it to destroy target permanent you own. Not too many scenarios in Limited that uh, would require that can pay 2 life after tapping to add 1 mana of any color. So, reminiscent of the mirror, but this one costs 3 mana to play as opposed to 2. Can tap it, pay 3 life to proliferate, that's maybe the best use of it as a way to finish off an opponent that has a bunch of poison counters or enable more oil counters, although 3 life adds up very quickly, so only be able to activate this a couple times. Can tap, pay 4 life to draw a card, there's easier ways to draw cards. And then 5 mana to untap Staff of Completion. So in the late game you could potentially activate this multiple times. But the question is, are you going to have enough life left to activate it in the first place? And I think the answer is no, unfortunately. So we'll give this a D. Sword of Forge and Frontier. 3 mana, Mythic Rare Equipment. Equips for 2 mana, giving plus 2 plus 2, protection from red and from green. And when the equipped creature deals damage to the opponent, we get to exile the top two cards of our library, and we may play those cards in addition to playing an extra land this turn. So even if we exile two lands, at least we can play both of them without anything going to waste. Yeah, this is powerful. Uh, Limited is a format full of creatures, and this can enhance all our creatures, even if it costs a bit of mana to set it up in the first place. And then if you're lucky enough to play against a red or green deck, this can be a nightmare for the opponent, thanks to the protection it grants. At its best in red-white equipment, but I think any creature deck is going to be happy to have the Sword of Forge and Frontier. So I'll give it an A. Definitely a bomb. Even if there are a few answers to artifacts out there that people might be main decking. Then the Mirror Kinsmith is 4 mana for a 3-1 Mirror at common. When it enters, we may search our library for a Mirror card, reveal it, and put it into our hand and shuffle. There's not very many Mirror cards in the sets, unfortunately. There's a Kinsmith. The 2-3 uh, that scries 2 and lets the opponent scry 1, and then there's the 2-drop that pays 2 life to ramp, essentially, and that's about it. So, unless you end up with like 3 or 4 kinsmiths in your deck that you can chain together, I would probably stay away from it. 1 toughness, also a bit awkward in this set in general. So we'll give this a D, but could be a fun kind of way to salvage a draft. If you happen to get a bunch of these late, it does give you a way to spend a lot of mana. A Ripskiff, 4 mana, uncommon artifact vehicle is a 4-4 with toxic 2, and when it enters we get to draw a card, so it replaces itself, that's nice. Although the crew cost is 3, which is pretty steep for a 4-4, four four. 
So not a huge fan of Rip's gift, but the fact that it replaces itself means it can't be too bad. So we'll give it a C. Then the Argentum Masticore does not mess around. 5 mana, 5-5 five, five artifact creature, Phyrexian Masticore at rare, has first strike and protection from multicolored. Not too many removal spells in multicolor, but the fact that it cannot be dealt damage by multicolor creatures and cannot be blocked by them could be relevant. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, we have to sacrifice a Masticore unless we discard a card. When we do discard a card this way, destroy target non-land permanent and opponent controls with mana value less than or equal to the mana value of the discarded card. So turns all our cards into removal spells, basically. So as long as we can keep a card in hand, we should be good to go. Probably at its best in like a blue deck that has a few card draw spells. And then the Master Core will quickly decimate the opponent's board. This feels like a bomb. I'll give it an A. Then a Grass Unstoppable Juggernaut is an 8 mana, 7 5 legendary Juggernaut at rare, artifact creature. And says Juggernauts you control attack each combat if able, as they do. And the Juggernauts you control cannot be blocked by walls, as they do. And other creatures we control have base power and toughness 5 3 and are Juggernauts in addition to their other types. So kind of a callback to the original Juggernaut. Yeah, this could be a nice finisher in a deck that can make a bunch of tokens. All of a sudden, your 1-1 one, one mites turn into 5-3 Juggernauts. And uh, yeah, that seems like a nice curve topper. Now, will require a pretty specific deck to excel, uh, especially a deck with a bit of mana acceleration to get to 8 mana, since that's not going to be easy otherwise. But uh, certainly has a pretty big impact the turn you play it. We'll give Grass a B. And then we get to the lanes. And here's a whole cycle of lands at common, one in each color, that enters the battlefield tapped, make a man of the respective color, and then we can pay one, and in this case a white, tap the fair basilica, and sacrifice it to draw a card. So it just gives us a nice mana sink in the late game to prevent flood, and uh, while these don't seem particularly impressive, I think you should actually prioritize them during the draft, especially if you already have enough playables for the deck. Improving your mana base is just a way to make the deck better without necessarily um, reducing the quality of the deck overall in other places. Since these days it's not like there's a ton of unplayable D or F tier cards where you need to make sure you have enough C level cards to get by. Uh, nowadays decks have way more than enough playables, so just spending a few picks improving your mana base by taking these lands to prevent flood is actually quite valuable. So we're going to give all of these a C plus grade. And also important to note, they have the sphere subtype. So if you do want to have fun with a monument, the monument can potentially surge these up to eventually turn into a 9-9. But for the most part, just happy to play these as flood insurance. So Fair Basilica, Surgical Bay is the blue one. Got the Dross Pits. Autonomous Furnace in red. And then Hunter Maze in green, I'll get a C+. Next we have the Fast Lands, reprinted, these are all rares. Enter the battlefield tapped, unless we control two or fewer other lands. So if it's one of our first three land drops, it will be untapped. Pretty useful in terms of mana fixing, although it is a real drawback when they enter tapped later in the game. So while they're good, I wouldn't go out of my way to prioritize them, unless you just want a rare draft for the collection, of course. So we'll give these a C plus as well. Definitely not as good as the Innistrad duels for limited, but still decent. So we've got Black Leaf Cliffs in red black, Copper Line Gorge, red green, and then Razor Verge in green white, and then we had the uh, blue black one as well. Next we have Mirex, a rare land with a sphere subtype once again, taps for colorless, or it can tap for one man of any color, but only if Mirex entered the battlefield this turn. So you're going to want to hold this in case you're uh, wanting for extra mana fixing until the turn you need it. And then we can also pay three mana, tap it, to make a 1-1 one, one Phyrexian Might creature token. So pretty decent mana sink, especially in the decks that care about poison or that care about going wide, or maybe care about artifacts in general. Actually willing to give this a B, since there aren't too many mana sinks in the set. So having a way to still spend our mana in the late game to make extra creatures is pretty useful. 
Next up is the Terramorphic Expanse, another reprint. Basically the same as Evolving Wilds, but uh, just got a different name. Can tap Sacrifice it to get a basic land, put it on the battlefield tapped. So I think two color decks are happy to have maybe one or even two copies of Expanse, especially if you have a lot of double colored cards. Outside of uh, two color decks, um, of course, the value of Expanse goes up if you've got three or four colors, thinking of Atraxa, as always, then uh, Expanse is going to be incredibly valuable. Then the Monumental Facade is a rare land sphere, enters with two oil counters on it, making a colorless mana when you tap it, and you can also tap, remove an oil counter from it to put it on a creature or artifact you control. So a neat way to maybe add some more oil counters to some permanents. Problem is, it's a colorless land. Mana bases in limiteds are actually pretty bad if you look at the numbers. So introducing more colorless sources as opposed to colored ones is a pretty big drawback. And the payoff here may not quite be worth it while oil counters are great. Um, I don't know if they're really worth the bad mana necessarily. And unlike the Mirex, this one doesn't seem worth it to me in most circumstances, but I'll go with a C. And then the Mycosynth Gardens is another rare sphere land making colors, but we can also make a man of any color, although it's going to cost us one extra mana to do so. So we've seen these lands before, usually not that good, but this one has the extra ability for X, we can tap it, and then it becomes a copy of target non-token artifact we control with mana value X. Okay, so this has some relevant late game utility, and even though it does cost us more mana to make colored mana, at least it can make colored mana. So this one, I think I'm happy to still give a C+. And then the Seed Core, another sphere land, making colorless, or one mana of any color that we can only spend to cast Phyrexian creature spells. And uh, as it turns out, almost half of the creatures in the set are Phyrexian in some way. So the mana fixing from Seed Core is actually relevant. And then it also has the Corrupted ability. If the opponent has three or more poison counters, we can tap it to make a 1-1 one, one creature get plus 2 plus 1 until end of turn. So perfect for pumping up our Might tokens, for instance. So the Seed Core also seems pretty decent, actually, especially in the poison decks. Gets a C+. Plus. So yeah, that concludes my limited set review for... Phyrexia all will be one. Overall, the set seems pretty fun. But for now, I want to thank everyone for watching. Again, as a reminder, if you want to support the channel and get access to a spreadsheet with all the updated card ratings for this uh, current set review, as well as all future and past set reviews, you can do so by becoming a Twitch subscriber or a supporter on Patreon. And that's always a very much appreciated. But for now, I want to thank everyone for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.